it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Three hours of stories for you this evening, told in the pouring rain. Now, I know a lot of you out there do use these longer videos to help you fall asleep at night. What we're going to do before the video begins is do a bit of guided breathing to help relax you and get you in the mood for sleep. So what we're doing here is not some process that will magically wipe your mind clear of the countless thoughts that are erupting and pinging constantly in your brains. No, we're just going to practice bringing our attention to our breath, and then back to our breath when we notice our attention has wandered. So before we begin, I want you to get comfortable and prepare to sit still for a few minutes. Then, you're going to simply focus on your own natural inhaling and exhaling of breath. Okay, so focus on your breath. Where do you feel your breath the most? Is it in your stomach, in your belly? Is it in your nose? Try to keep your attention on your inhale and exhale. Now, before the stories begin, we're going to follow our breaths for two minutes. Take a deep inhale, expanding your belly, and then exhale slowly, elongating the out-breath as your belly contracts. Now, a deep inhale, expand the belly, and then exhale slowly. Elongating the out-breath as your belly contracts. So how are you all feeling now? I hope you're in the mood for some stories told in the pouring rain. Interest is what we feel when we discover something. Something that speaks to the soul, but pulls us in and wraps itself around the fibers of our being and leaves little room, for a time, for much else. It's not fleeting attentiveness, I describe, that which comes and goes without much thought, like seeing a butterfly floating idly by, capturing the attention until it's flown from sight, leaving one to carry on plainly. No, it's the interest that becomes engrossment that I speak of, that starting point, the basis, that which becomes passion, and from there, obsession. Most of the time these things start at a young age, carried through the formative years by childlike curiosity, before the corruption of the real world can soil the dream. This wasn't the case for me. I was already an adult when I found it. The world had been cruel, callous and uncaring. I didn't really live so much as merely exist in it, average in every sense of the word, probably below it. My grades in school were enough to get by, but not enough to get into a decent university. It didn't matter much because I didn't have any idea what I wanted to do. I had a girlfriend that I loved deeply for a time, but well, she's gone now. She left with the only friend I had. I haven't spoken to my family in years. They cast me out due to what they called issues. It's just me. But it's probably for the better. I don't need the distractions. I don't feel the pain anymore. I remember the day I found my purpose. I remember the shadow of the church steeple as I walked down the broken concrete path beside the wrought iron fence. The place that was my hometown was a place suspended in the past like the Spanish moss that hung from the cypress trees. Fixed there. Unmoving. 
Through an open door I could hear a preacher shouting the normal sermon of fire and brimstone. It made me shudder, but I can't tell you what he was saying exactly. I was just focused on getting to my job at the car dealership. The droning of religious drivel faded behind me, and I kept my eyes down, avoiding the judgmental looks of everyone that thought they knew me as I rounded the cornerstone pillar. I was thinking about the stack of paperwork I was sure was waiting for me, delegated by the crook-tongued salesman, and I knew I wasn't strong enough to refuse to do it. I felt anxious, lost in thought, playing out scenarios in my head where I told them all off and walked out. But I knew it wasn't going to happen. My chest felt constricted. I tried to breathe deeply to fend off the incoming panic attack. I closed my eyes tightly and trudged forward. And that's when I ran into him. Quite literally, I walked into a dark, towering man. I don't remember many of the details. He wore a hat, a thick wool coat that gave off a musty smell, and had a cane. He had icy blue eyes that seemed to glow coldly from the shadows of his face. I remember trying profusely to apologise as I adjusted my backpack straps. I don't know if he heard me, but I was able to get the words out before I felt the knife being jammed into my stomach. I staggered back as he jerked the blade out and I watched the blood oozing from beneath my fingers as I sank to the ground. Tears streamed down my face. I tried to speak, but couldn't. My vision was fading and my head swam. But I remember him turning around, casting one last look at me before he disappeared. But the words he said before I fell into unconsciousness. Let us see if you all do. Remember, child, to give back. When I woke up, I was in a hospital bed. The room was empty. It smelled of metallic sterility and bad food, like my high school cafeteria. That in itself was enough to cause a wave of anxiety to wash over me. My entire body ached. I attempted to sit up and felt my breath catch in my throat as a sharp pain shot through my abdomen. Upon pulling back the hospital gown, I saw the staples that ran like snake scales down the left side of my stomach, evidently keeping my entrails from spilling out. A nurse eventually came in, asking me how I felt, and if I had insurance. I told her I didn't. She nodded and explained that a doctor would be with me shortly, and that maybe the billing staff and I could arrange a cash payment plan. She left as I again felt the tears welling up in my eyes. I had a little bit of savings, but nothing that could come close to covering a hospital bill. My backpack was laying on a table next to the bed, and I reached for it, searching for my phone to call the car dealership and let them know what had happened, hoping I wouldn't lose my job. I didn't find my phone at first as I dug through the backpack. I did, however, feel something cold, rough, and almost slimy to the touch. It seemed to spark as my hand grazed it and I recoiled with a crushing surge of pain coursing through my stomach again. After another breath, I managed to compose myself, and using a pen, I lifted the flap of the backpack to try and see what was in it. Nestled among work papers was a book. It looked to be bound in some type of black-stained reptilian leather, and well, maybe I was hallucinating because of the pain medication, but it seemed to glow. Against the wishes of the attending doctor, I checked myself out of the hospital. He suggested I stay, but understood that every hour I spent was increasing a bill I already couldn't afford. I was stable, physically, and that was as good as it was going to get. I hugged tightly to the backpack as they pushed me in a wheelchair to the front door. I didn't have anyone to pick me up, but the lady at the front desk was kind enough to pay for an Uber for me to get home. As I thanked her, I noticed the pity in her eyes. Well, this was a new kind of low, even for me. I dreaded having to get down the stairs to the basement apartment I'd rented. I only made it with the help of the Uber driver once we arrived, complete with the same look of pity. I sank down onto my couch and finally texted my boss, telling him what had happened, wondering if I did still have a job. 
Oh, we'll talk about it, was the response I got. I dropped the phone and began crying again, unable to stop, and ignoring the pull of the staples in my skin. I cried until I passed out. It was night when I woke, the thin curtains on my tiny windows letting the light of the full moon in. I was hungry, but too sore to eat. The backpack was still by my side, tipped over with the contents half spilled out. The book was still there. The same eerie blue glow, more evident in the darkness. I stared for a long time before I touched it. Again it sent a spark of chills through me, and I threw it across the room. It bounced off the wall, clattering to the floor and into the shaft of moonlight. I watched in horror as it began to glow even brighter. It appeared to be absorbing the moonlight, flickering, causing strange shadows to grow and move across the walls. The shadows danced erratically, taking shape, melding together, splitting and stretching up to the ceiling. They moved like black water being sloshed in a glass. I thought I could hear a low buzz and felt myself being drawn towards the book. I hadn't even realised that I'd slipped off the couch and was on all fours, crawling towards it. I looked down to see the trail of blood dribbling behind me as two of my staples had ripped out. I didn't feel it. I didn't feel anything. I heard a voice as I reached for the book, but I couldn't stop myself. It echoed in my head as my fingertips lightly crossed the binding. It was deafening as I pulled the book towards me, opening it with an explosion of bright yellow light that illuminated my entire apartment, as if the sun itself was shining from the pages. Remember, child, to give back. I didn't leave my apartment for days afterward. I didn't eat, sleep, or even drink. I never felt the urge. I pored over the pages, written in symbols that looked like hieroglyphics. I didn't understand any of it at first, but over time it became clearer. Every hour that passed, the words began to decipher themselves, and I felt my wound healing. The staples popped out on their own, as if being rejected by my body. And by the time the stab wound was little more than a tiny pink scar, I could read every word. Across the first page it simply said, The Lost Magic. Book One. There was no introduction, no author, no work cited. The pages were yellowed with age, full of what seemed to be spells, curses, charms and rituals. Different methods added by different hands over time, it seemed. I felt a power that I'd never felt before, a thrilling confidence that I'd been resisting. My hands shook as I stood, book in one hand, and a red marker from the backpack in the other. I began to draw on the wall. It was hard at first, looking down at the page, then up, eyes flitting back and forth as I slashed the marker against the cheap wood panelling. Eventually my hand began to move on its own. The book slipped from my grasp and fell to the floor, staying open on the same page, so I didn't look at it. My eyes fell half shut as I swayed back and forth, whipping the marker up and down, hair falling into my eyes, but I was in a trance-like state. I felt as if I was floating as I mumbled my words, stating my needs, what I thought I might give in return, what I desired, what I willed to come true, what I absolutely craved. The marker fell from my hand after the last line was complete. I held my arms wide and tilted my head back, My eyes rolled back into my head and a voice that didn't sound like my own shouted, And so it shall be. The knock at my door woke me up. It was daylight. I wasn't sure how long I'd been out. I stirred, sluggish at first, but my body felt strong. It was my mind that was hazy. I pushed myself up to my feet as the knocking continued. I walked to the door at the top of the stairs and twisted the locks, pausing before opening it slightly, peering around the corner to see an older man wearing a suit. His voice was friendly enough, but he showed sorrow in his eyes. Hello there. 
Is there an Aubrey rubber show that lives here? I blinked, pushed the hair out of my face and nodded. Yeah, I'm Aubrey. Ah, uh, I'm sorry to hear about your loss. You were listed as beneficiary on the life insurance claim. He held out an envelope to me. I took it, confused. I'll leave you alone now. Sorry to disturb you during these times. My office information is in the envelope. Whenever you're feeling up to it, drop by the office and you can sign for the check. He offered a polite smile and turned to leave as I closed the door and locked it. I walked back down the stairs with the envelope, flipping it over a few times before settling on the couch and opening it. Papers slipped out onto my coffee table and I picked them up. I unfolded them to see what everything meant. I skimmed over the lines of legal jargon until I got to the line that listed the deceased. I dropped the paper when I saw the name of my ex-girlfriend. Well, initially, I was shocked, but I kept reading. I remembered the talk we'd had when we were together, when she got a new job that offered life insurance, how she said she didn't know who else to list as a beneficiary besides me. Well, I hadn't thought much of it at the time. Maybe there was a mistake, and she'd forgotten to change it when she left me. I looked at the paper again. The amount listed would more than cover my medical bills from the stabbing, with quite a bit left over. I felt a gnawing feeling come over me then, creeping up from the deepest pit of my stomach, spreading through my body. My breaths came quickly as I turned my gaze towards the wall. The red slashes, marks and patterns were still there. The book still sat on the floor, but it wasn't glowing anymore. It looked like any other book. The sigil of wealth attraction. Well, it had worked. I suppose I should have felt remorse. Should have felt something, anything for the cost. But I didn't. It felt like, well, karmic justice. She had left me so vulnerable, so shattered. My best wasn't good enough for her, no matter how hard I tried. And now, she was dead, and I was going to be debt-free because of it. And I felt better at that moment than I had in years. It didn't take me long to shower and put on clean clothes. I even took the time to style my hair. I had an appointment, after all. Before I walked up the stairs, I looked at the wall, and then to the book, and I smiled. I spent that whole day running errands. I got the check pretended to be upset but thankful, and paid off the hospital after depositing it at the bank. I'd never seen my account balance so high, even after all of the bills. In celebration, I decided to go out to eat. Oh, the newfound confidence I had was intoxicating. There was a seafood place downtown that I really enjoyed but could rarely afford. It would be a welcome change from the cheap rations I was used to especially since I literally couldn't remember how long it had been since my last meal. I walked across the street towards a line of weathered brick buildings and neon signs. From the corner of my eye, I thought I could see a figure. Imagination, perhaps. I kept walking. The smell of food was making my mouth water and my stomach rumbled. It was a nice day and the doors were open everywhere. Just before I stepped across the threshold of the restaurant, I felt it, a hand on my shoulder that wrenched me backwards. My feet left the ground and I hung suspended as time slowed all around me and the world grew hazy and translucent. People were paused mid-step, beer pouring out of a tap ceased mid-stream, hanging against gravity. It's as if I'd been pulled from the world and into a separate dimension, shielded from human eyes. I realized then that I could move, the hand on my shoulder effortlessly spinning me round. My feet kicked and my hands flailed, but against nothing. The cold blue eyes stared at me from beneath the shadows of a hat brim, and the musty smell of wool filled my nostrils. Be calm, child, came a deep voice that filled my head. I stopped struggling and hung there in the nothingness. Good fortune has found you, the voice continued, though I couldn't see a mouth that uttered the words. What do you want? I asked in a panic. What will you give? 
a token, perhaps, of your appreciation, to show your thanks, to acknowledge us. Well, you must give back, child. Tell me, I shouted in exasperation. We cannot tell you what to give, or else it is not a gift. Do not wait too long, else I'll be undone. I fell then from suspension. The haze swirled about me and was gone by the time my feet hit the ground. I blinked and looked around. The world had come back to life. There was laughter amidst the music, the clatter of dishes somewhere and the scratching of a chair against the floor. I didn't move for a moment until jolted back to presence by the hostess asking how many in my party. I stumbled over my words before stammering that I would be alone. She nodded and bid me to follow her to a table on the patio. Your server will be right with you. I thanked her as she wandered back through the maze of tables. I sat collecting my thoughts until the waiter came up. I looked at him with his wide smile and couldn't help but smile back, feeling all of a sudden at ease. I don't know why I left my phone number on the receipt next to a generous tip. I normally don't do such things. I'm not that forward. I tried not to think about it as I looked at the objects scattered across my living room. The book was little help, so I turned to the internet. I needed to construct an altar, or at least I thought I needed to. Give back. Those words kept repeating themselves in my head. I piled flat stones next to the wall where I'd drawn the sigil. Upon them I placed a large, heavy wooden platter. Next came the candles. <laughs> I felt a bit ridiculous, like I was involved in some stereotypical horror movie, but I didn't know what else to do, and the scar where I'd been stabbed was starting to ache. All must not be undone. I knelt down and lit the candles, attempting to make my offering. Herbs and tobacco, a glass of rum, and a tin of scented oil. I closed my eyes and spoke out in a quiet voice, bidding that who or whatever required the gift took it. The candles flickered and the pain of the wound faded away. I opened my eyes and took a deep breath. It worked. <laughs> that was easy enough, I sighed. I went to stand when the pain came back, sudden and sharp, causing me to double over and hit the altar. The glass of rum broke and liquid ran across the platter, pooling up until I could see what appeared to be two eyes in it staring at me with disapproval. There was a knock at my door then, and the eyes disappeared. I heard a voice calling from the top of the stairs. The pain lessened, and I stood. Hey, Aubrey. Are you here? It's Sam. The waiter from the restaurant. We'd been talking and texting for a couple of days, and were supposed to go out on a date. He'd arrived to pick me up. I'd completely forgotten. Oh, yeah. Come on in, I shouted up the stairs as I shuffled into the bathroom. I'll be out in a minute. I looked into the mirror, pushing the hair from my face as I heard the door open and shut, and heard footsteps coming down the stairs. Make yourself at home. I won't be long, I called out as I tried to compose myself, blood beginning to seep from the wound. I rummaged through the drawer and found a bandage, pressing it to my stomach. No hurry. Kind of creepy in here, I heard him say. He sounded distracted, and I began to panic again. The altar, the sigil, he was seeing all of it. Maybe he'd ignore it. Oh, Ow! shit, I heard him utter then, and the pain in my wound subsided. I felt a surge throughout my body. I stood up then, slowly peeling the bandage back. Everything looked fine. The wound was back to a small pink scar, and the blood was gone. I looked at myself in the mirror, hardly recognizing the face I was looking at as I spoke. Everything all right out there? I asked sweetly. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to be messing with your stuff. I cut my finger on some broken glass you got here. What is all of this? Are you a witch or something? I opened the bathroom door and walked out. The light was dim in the room as the sun was setting. I smiled coyly as I stepped near him. He was holding his bleeding finger, and I reached out, gently taking his hand into mine. I looked at the cut, 
and then down at the altar. The blood had mixed with the rum in a swirling pool. The flash of an eye shone briefly before figures began to flicker and dance as they had on the walls that first night. I spun him gently, dropping his hand and running one of my own across his back and onto his shoulder. I leaned in then as he tilted his head back, his breath growing quicker, and in his ear I whispered, hmm, something like that. There wasn't much of a struggle as I plunged the scissors from the bathroom drawer into his neck, again and again, the spray of red falling like a soft summer rain. It covered me in a light mist that eventually gathered to run in rivulets down my face and neck. Blood poured onto the altar. He fell, gurgling onto the floor, holding his throat, kicking weakly as the life began to fade from his eyes. The flames of the candles grew until they seemed to lick at the ceiling. I dropped the scissors and leaned over the altar, placing a hand on each side of it, staring at the pool of dancing figures until a face appeared. Blue eyes stared at me from the murk. I offer this as a token of my gratitude, I spoke through clenched teeth. The eyes seemed to grow until I could see a face, then the face became an entire head. The white teeth were nearly blinding as the head smiled and the eyes gave me a wink. Everything then faded as the candles snuffed themselves out. I felt alive with power. And I liked it. It took days of scrubbing to erase the sign of him from my apartment. His car and body I got rid of that night down the curve of the levee road into the river of the dead man curve. Uh, if he's ever found it, it'll be like everyone else who's ever driven off of it to be claimed by the dark water. They'll say he was driving too fast, missed the turn. Maybe they'll eventually put up a guardrail. I wasn't worried. No one would suspect a nobody like me of having anything to do with it. No one would probably ever believe I was ever at that fancy of a restaurant to begin with. What I wanted to focus on was the book, to maintain the power. I read through it over and over again until I believed I'd found a way to harness the magic, to wield it without elaborate ritual. Of course, I'd need to give it back, but I had an idea. I picked up the marker and stood before the wall and an empty panel, and I began to create. I waited until night to ascend the staircase and venture into the world. I felt good, and I looked good. I was essentially a new person, and I carried myself with a grace I didn't think was possible. There was the slightest bit of breeze that caused the branches of the cypress trees to sway as I walked beneath the arches they made on the edge of town. Any other time in my life, I'd have been terrified, afraid something would be spat from the depths of night to take me. But no more. I didn't feel fear. I felt as though the night would bend to my will. It was a high that was addictive. It wasn't long until I saw the house, a single pitiful beam of light spilling from a window. The bedroom window. I knew that place well. I watched through the pane of glass, standing in the vegetable garden. How well, she loved her gardening. The figure walked back and forth, alternating between sitting on the edge of the bed and a chair in front of a television. I lifted my hand, cupping it to my mouth like a microphone for my experiment. I whispered his name. Kevin. He jerked his head up and began looking around the room. I smiled behind my hand as he shrugged and settled again. Kevin. I whispered once more, causing him to shoot up to his feet. I stepped backwards as I saw him approach the window, slipping around the corner of a small tool shed and out of sight. I glanced around the corner to see him turn, shaking his head and walking to his closet. He opened it and pulled a pistol down off of the top shelf. I recognised it. It was the same one he'd wanted for so long, the one I'd seen him dream about, the one I'd saved money for so long so that I could give it to him on his birthday before he stole her from me, back when we were still friends. I wound my way back through the garden, 
sitting with my back against the wall of the house beneath the window. I closed my eyes and let my thoughts drift back through time. I thought about when we were young, two awkward children who protected each other from the bullies. We played together, laughed together, told each other secrets, and grew together. As he came into his own as a young man, we began to drift apart. But that was all right, we were still dear friends. I wrapped my arms around my chest as I sat there, hugging myself tightly and gently rocking back and forth. I could hear light sobbing from inside. I thought about how happy I was when I met her, and couldn't wait to introduce the two of them. The look on their faces, how much it hurt when I realized there was something going on when I wasn't around. The anguish I felt, the shame that I couldn't bring myself to confront them, look of pity they gave me when they knew that I knew but wouldn't say it. The utter devastation when they both walked away together, leaving me behind. My eyes were squeezed shut hard against the tear that threatened to trickle down my face as I remembered everything. How unbearable the pain had been, how I'd thought about killing myself just so it would stop. I was making him feeling it. He was feeling it all as I had. The physical and mental strain that haunted me all that time. How broken I was, seeing no way out. I didn't look back when I heard the gunshot. The thud of a body against the floor was all the confirmation I needed. When I opened my eyes, they were dry, and I felt like a weight had been lifted. How satisfying it was that he finally felt it all just as I had. That his last moments were moments of grief, confusion, and a feeling that nothing could help. I took a deep breath as I pushed up and away from the wall, and I walked back into the darkness, spinning with my arms held out, letting the night wrap around me like a shroud. I smiled and laughed as it took me. This was my destiny. It was getting late, I thought. Dawn wouldn't be too far away. Still, I'd need to pay for the power, for the favor, and that was all right. The path I chose to take home would lead right by the preacher's house, and I knew he lived alone. And that was how it all started. No one looks at me with pity in their eyes anymore. If anything, it's now envy. Envy of the boldness with which I carry myself, the aura of strength that I exude, the supreme confidence with which I speak. No one feels sorry for me anymore. Now they wish they were me. Obviously, I had to leave my hometown. In order to fly, I had to leave the nest, so to speak, but not before leaving my mark. I hear rumours from time to time of something worse than evil that lives there. I've got much better at the whole thing. I've even managed to find more of the books. Turns out it's a set. A long, ancient set that has been added to by various cultures for thousands of years. It shouldn't exist. But it does, and I have made it my mission to complete it. It's become my passion, my obsession, my quest to find the real magic. The spirits guide me, and I hope will continue to do so as long as I remember to give something back. I sat in the corridor of the old stone farmhouse waiting on the children who were still left to come back. I even had blood all over my body and no memory of why I'd found myself in this situation. My last memory was myself in a room telling what I hoped would be the last story I had to tell in this new wretched world we now find ourselves living in. You see, two years ago, 
just after my 18th birthday. The version we know as the world ended. I was the only survivor over the age of 18. One afternoon, I was in my car with some friends when a white light arose in the middle of the afternoon. It was so quick that we barely noticed it, but my friends who were in the car at the time, both already 18, began to feel strangely ill, shortly after dying a day or so later. Soon there were the deaths of other neighbours of ours, friends of my parents, all adults. The children remained healthy. The first person in my house to die was my dad. One afternoon he went to lie down, and he stopped breathing, turning white almost immediately, like something you would see in a movie. His hair went white first, travelling down to his stiff body. It was bizarre to see it take hold of him so rapidly. Then came the day my mother went. She'd lasted several days longer than my dad. My mother was standing in the kitchen cooking breakfast for my sister, Katie, and I, trying to hold her grief in check, telling us a story about our dad when they were young, when she stopped. I heard her sigh as though she'd begun to cry. There were tears on her pale cheeks when she slowly turned around and looked at my sister and I. Her eyes had turned white, and then I watched her die in front of my eyes. My mother, frozen, dropped the spatula that was in her hand and she fell to the floor, twisted and broken like a rag doll. It was so quiet and sudden, I barely smelt the bacon burning and barely heard the sound of the grease popping in the skillet. The skin was the colour of snow now. I looked at my sister, who had already begun crying in fits of panic. What are we going to do, Ian? Tell me what to do, Katie screamed, running to our mother's side. It was that moment that I became responsible for my sister. Then it turned into my caring for some of the younger kids in the neighbourhood. At first, they came begging for food or looking up to me for guidance. I was the eldest. All my other friends had died or run away. Everyone over the age of 17 was dead. That wasn't the only thing that happened. The wildlife seemed to grow faster than ever before. Electricity no longer existed. It was as though something came out of the sky and snuffed out the very life of our planet. I took the children I'd become ward of when I was barely much older than they were. Together, we tried to find help. Instead, I began to collect other children along the way. It was hard to manage, but I had my sister Katie, who was nearing her 18th birthday. It was going on two years now since the strange event. We'd settled not too far away from where I'd lived, in a rural area where there had once been a small farming community. I'd stumbled upon a moderately sized farmhouse with six bedrooms. Luckily for us, there were plenty of resources available on this farm. There was even a creek with fresh water that we boiled daily. There was running water in the house for a while, until it stopped. Lush forests surrounded the farm, and the main road had become overgrown. The vehicles that were on the property didn't have a lot of gas left in them. However, Whoever owned the farm had been generous by leaving the keys to the cars. When I did take a drive out to look for food, I didn't go far in case of an emergency. The first year was the easiest. Then supplies went fast. It was hard keeping them all fed. There were at least twenty or thirty now, and the children didn't understand how rationing worked. First, they ate up the food that was already in the house, and then, when that was gone... The winter had brought on other issues. It was hard keeping warm, and so some of them became ill. The temperatures were so cold that, even when you were indoors, the chill was barely infiltrated. Instead of finding dry wood in the nearby woods one afternoon, I'd come back to the house in disarray. Blankets were removed from bedding, chairs were upside down, and some of the older kids were throwing furniture in the large fireplace. What are you doing? I yelled, grabbing two of the older boys, Tim and Tony, who were twins and who'd recently turned 13. We hate it here. 
It's always cold, and there's never any food, because we have to ration it out to the little ones. But I'm tired, and I'm sick of living like this. Tim pushed and hit me in the chest. I let him, because I knew he needed to. And then tears fell from both our eyes. I stood, unsure of what to say, but I somehow found the words. I recalled my father telling me about how life could take harsh turns. The look on all the children's faces told me what it was that I needed to say next. Life is hard. We grew up being told that if we suffer disappointment, it makes it easier to face. I don't believe that, though. I believe that disappointment still hurts, but it only stacks the anger through each blow life gives us. But children, we can't let it anger us. We have to be better than those disappointments. Come, look at the fire Tim and Tony made for us. Sure, it's hard bedroom linen, broken bits of chair. But we have warmth. Feel it. Feel the warmth. I didn't know I had the words in me to make them listen. Each one came over in their dark and stained clothes, warming their hands by the large fireplace. That night, after our dinner, I was reading to the smaller children as a form of entertainment since there was no electricity for TV. And that's when little Shelby Parsons, who was roughly only six or seven, looked up into my dark eyes. Ian, I want you to tell us a new story. This one's boring, she said, hugging her knees. Then the other children chimed in with their voices. Yeah, tell us a scary story. Little James said from the back of the large couch, which now adorned ketchup stains. A scary story. But don't you like hearing stories about fairies that help wandering travellers in the woods? Or princes that rescue the princess? I asked. No, we want blood, said a raspy voice coming from the back of the room. It was a boy of no more than twelve years old. Henry who was always trying to act out his dominance on the four smaller children. Hmm, scary, eh? I don't think that the farmers that lived here before had any books about scary things, I said, standing up, looking around the books on the built-in shelf. No, tell us one of your stories, Shelby said. I don't have any, I laughed. Make up your own story for us, Shelby exclaimed pouting with her dark, curly hair falling into her blue eyes. I smiled at her, and I looked around the room and thought very hard of the scariest story I could make up. Finally, I figured I would begin, and perhaps it would come to me as I went along. To make it scarier, I grabbed a few props from the closet. One object, a black cape that looked like it was part of a costume at some point. The other a large red candle that I sat on the small coffee table in front of me. And I closed my eyes, took a deep breath, and when I opened them, I'd become someone else. I became their scary narrator. Once upon a time in a small village lived a little boy and a little girl. My voice had shifted, my neck cracked a little, and I felt the sound coming out of me was not my own. Instead, the voice that came from my lips was one of pure evil. They had grown up in a place that, if you wore colour, the monsters that lived in the trees would see you and eat your flesh. So all the people who lived in the village wore only black. So the monsters didn't see them and eat them because, because the monsters love little children the best. Why did they love little children the best? Shelby asked, interrupting me. I thought for a second before continuing. Because all little children have bones that taste like sweet candy. When the children wore bright colours, they looked like candy too, so it was easier to identify them. My voice had an audible click, and it deepened to almost a growl. I had no idea where it was coming from, but the story came to me like a movie playing out in my head. I was shocked by how dark and cavernous it sounded in the room. It echoed across the walls and bounced up into the stairwell, where some of the older children had slowly come to sit and listen on top of the stairs. 
One afternoon, the little boy and the little girl were found dead at the edge of the village. The only thing left of their two tiny bodies were the brightly colored rainbow shirt the little girl had on and the bright green shirt the little boy had on. I saw little Shelby gasp and cling to little James. I glared at them both, enjoying my evil character as I continued. The town was frightened and uncertain as to how to rid themselves of the dark beings that had caused the town such turmoil. The alien beings had to be stopped. So, after the sun went down on the small town, the townsfolk gathered around the church bell that rang every hour on the hour and made a plan to destroy the aliens. There was a loud bang on the roof of the farmhouse, interrupting my story. The children screamed and stood at once, pleading with their eyes as they looked upon me for comfort. I walked towards the front door and it opened it slowly. I stepped outside and looked up at the roof. It appeared as though a large branch had fallen on top of it. I walked back into the house and looked at the children. It's just a tree branch, is all. Let's finish our story tomorrow after dinner. Got time for bed, everyone. Oh, just when things were starting to get good, Henry groaned. I smiled and blew out the candle. I looked up and saw my sister Katie smiling at me. Good job, big brother. I knew what she meant, and she and I were both glad that we'd found a way to entertain the rowdy bunch. The next morning there was a fresh layer of snow on the ground. It was early October, and seemed far too early in the year for ice and snow. I was chopping up the branch that had fallen on the roof the night before and figured we could use it for firewood. I stacked the wood and began piling it up against the wall of the barn when I heard shrieking. I saw my sister Katie running towards me as fast as lightning, her winter coat falling off her shoulders as she ran towards me. It's Shelby. Come, quick. I ran with her towards the house and once inside... Shelby was sitting on the couch with her pink t-shirt, jeans, no socks or shoes, which was strange considering it was frigid in the house. I looked at Katie and one of the other girls, Tara, who were trying to comfort Shelby. What happened to her? She fell from the tree. She was so high up, Tara exclaimed, barely having enough breath in her tiny body to tell me what had happened. How did she do that? I begged taking her little hand into mine. I was at the top of that one, Shelby said, out of breath, as she pointed at the tall oak outside the window. I looked at that tree. It had to be at least thirty or forty feet tall, and I knew there was no way she was climbing that tree. Out by the cornfields were a row of small apple trees. I assume she meant one of those. The monster it picked me up and took me into the tree, I screamed, and then it dropped me, Shelby said, in between heavy breathing. I looked at Katie and Tara, bewildered by what this could mean. I still had a hard time believing it was possible. I kissed little Shelby on the forehead and tried to reassure her the best I could that everything would be all right. I feared she might have had broken ribs by the way she was breathing. I stepped into the hallway between the dining room and the living room, where Shelby was on the couch, and then my sister followed me. What are we going to do, Ian? I don't know. There has to be something you can do. What about all that stuff Shelby was saying about there being a monster? Katie, she's six years old. Kids have vivid imaginations, especially after trauma. What are you going to do? Look, I'm not a goddamn doctor, I snapped. Then, when I looked at her, I softened. I'll see if the farmers that lived here have any medical books in the library. Maybe you or Tara can help. I still have to cook breakfast for them all. Tara can help you. I'll send her in after she gets them all ready for their daily lessons. I nodded and then went and locked myself into the library. Every time I looked at the large house we found ourselves in, I felt lucky to have been in the right place at the right time. Whoever had lived here before was pretty well prepared, and when we stumbled upon the site, 
The occupants had not been gone very long at all. There was still fresh food in the refrigerator until the electricity finally stopped working. Whatever had made everyone sick had also cut off the world from internet, power, running water and heat. It was as if someone or something had hit a switch and turned it off and we returned to the dark ages again. Tara was a year younger than Katie and while she was smart and helpful She was very restrained from showing any form of human-like emotions. The only thing she was good at was teaching the children. It had been her idea to make them sit in a sort of home school and teach them about survival from the books in the library and the history of things. It helped occupy the youngest ones, but the older kids didn't stick around, usually spent their days off wandering the woods or hunting animals. Sometimes they brought the food back to share, Other times they would go into the woods for days at a time. There was chaos at all times, always anger boiling just below the surface. We were lucky to have had no incidents like the one with Shelby in the last two years since the world ended. I held out hope we would find others, mainly other adults that could help. So far, in the two years of searching and scouting, I'd found only bones, and children with no homes and no one to look after them, except me. I fumbled through the books most of the day and found the information on how to treat broken bones. I did the best I could. Having been a football player for most of my teenage years, I knew a few things about injuries. I did the best I could in patching up Shelby with what I found in the books in the library. By the end of the day, she was sitting up on the couch smiling in her usual way. I felt guilty that there was nothing more I could do. There was one thing, however. Night fell upon the farmhouse that night, and there was a distinct chill in the air that wasn't there before. Everyone was home that night, so the living room was crowded, and a few of the children were playing games, and Tim and Tony were arguing about something. Anyone want a story? I asked in a commanding tone. Shelby sat up from her place on the couch and clapped her hands. Yes, another scary story. Yeah, but not like that stupid one you told last night, Henry said with his raspy voice. He sounded like someone that had chain-smoked their entire life, but he was only twelve years old. Very well. Let me get set up. I found my cape and lit my red candle. This time I hid a coffee mug of bourbon next to me for my nerves after the day I'd had. And then I began telling a new story. This one felt like it wasn't coming from me at all, but that I was possessed by something inside of me. Demons are real, children. They love to come out at night. Some of them even sneak inside your bed and crawl inside of your mouth to live there. Some of them get right inside of your belly and give you a bellyache you couldn't possibly stop, even with the best medicines. They get inside and stay like a parasite. They make you do and say horrible things, and sometimes hurt others. I looked around the room and felt slight darkness boiling inside of me. I wanted to scare the children. It felt good in some strange dysfunctional way. I couldn't explain it. I looked around the room, and when I thought of all the things I had had to do and sacrifice so that they could exist, I felt resentment. Suddenly my skin began to itch, and I felt hot. I continued with my story. Demons like to play with you even when you're not looking. They watch you from dark crevices in the walls and outside your window on a stormy night. They hang about in spider webs so small you would never know they were there. Demons love sitting in trees and drop things on you like sadness and depression. But their favorite ever is giving you evil thoughts. The only way to get rid of them is to fight hard against it. If that doesn't work, pray. And if that doesn't work, well, there's always death. There was a silence in the room that gave me pause. I took a deep breath, trying to figure out what was wrong with me. Hatred for them had risen like acid reflux on my tongue. My love for them seemed to diminish, and then return after I'd finished my story. 
Didn't like that one either, Henry yelled from behind the couch. I sighed, laughing a bit to myself. Well, it's bedtime anyhow. Tara has lessons for you in the morning. Henry came over and put his hand on my shoulder. Ian, we need to work on your idea of stories. And I will say, you are scary when you tell these stories. Your eyes get black and your voice changes. It's like you have a demon inside of you when you're telling the story. I smiled and I sat back thinking, if only he knew. There was a windstorm so bad that night I could barely sleep. I curled around my bed, which was in the attic. It was also the coldest room in the house because it had no insulation and there was a crack in one of the windows that always seemed to return no matter how hard I tried to repair it. The sound of glass breaking on the second floor had me rise from my bed and rush to see what was the matter. When I reached the second floor, I nearly fell onto the wooden hall, trying to see what had caused the sound. Something inside of me told me there was something very, very wrong. My gut never lied to me, and then I saw it. Henry was standing at the end of the hallway. There was a large bay window that overlooked the farm, and would have been beautiful on any other occasion. But the view that met me was one of pure horror. Henry's eyes were black as night. His skin was yellow, and his mouth seemed to foam. He looked like he was in pain as he bent over, falling to the floor. I ran to him and placed my hand upon his shoulder. When I did, he felt hot to the touch, as though he had a horrific fever. I removed my hand quickly. Henry, are you okay? He began to heave in the same manner as a cat, like he was in the process of regurgitating a hairball. I backed away and ran to grab a cold washcloth and a bucket from the bathroom and ran to his side. I nearly wet myself from what I saw when I returned. Henry was regurgitating something dark from his throat, like a thick black goo. When it hit the floor, it made a loud splash. Henry continued to heave and hurl, and he began to scream, groaning in pain. He looked up at me as a low, forceful growl came out of his belly. Then he opened his mouth again as a white snake with glowing red eyes slivered from out of his mouth onto the floor and came towards me with the intent to do me harm. The way it looked to me, it was as if it knew me. I backed away and fell back onto the stairs that led to my bedroom in the attic. Katie and the others were now in the hallway watching me, and I found myself unsure of what was happening. Tara came forward and hit the snake with a hammer, killing it. When she did, Henry collapsed to the ground. I ran over to him and saw that he was still breathing, but he was out cold. It was almost as if he were in a coma. I carried him to his bed and cleaned him up as best as we could, propping his head up onto a thick pillow. I left his room and sat on the steps, unsure of what to do. I was still in shock, shaking as I tried to wrap my brain about what was happening, as too were the others. Katie came over to me and sat next to me and looked into my eyes. What the hell was that? I looked down into her eyes and shook my head. Like the story you told us, Tara said, coming up from behind me. Katie looked at her and then got up and walked away, slamming the door to the room she shared with Tara. I thought it was a strange reaction, but my sister had been acting strangely lately. She'd grown secretive and sullen, keeping to herself most of the time. Tara said nothing else. Instead, she and the others returned to their rooms, afraid for the rest of the night to leave the safety of their beds. I finally returned to my room, but there seemed to be stillness and a chill in the air, giving me the feeling like something or someone was watching me. I managed to fall into a deep sleep, and when I did, all I had were nightmares. A creature filled with bloodlust on all fours was after all of us. I woke to the sound of birds chirping, the sound of the other children in the yard playing. Perhaps there was hope after all. 
Then my door burst open and all hope was lost. Katie was standing at the foot of my bed, fuming. My 18th birthday is in two weeks, she said to me as I sat up bewildered as to what she was going on about, especially after last night. I don't understand what the hell you're talking about. Why is that important? Has anyone checked on Henry? He's fine. He doesn't remember anything from last night, thank God. Where is he? I need to speak to him. He ate breakfast. Now he's sleeping. Lucky for us, he's fine. Maybe not for you. Who are you? I looked at her, still confused. Why are you still alive? You're the only adult that survived the end of the world. How did you do it? I want to know, Ian, because I don't want to die in two weeks. She began to cry frantically. I don't know why I'm still alive. I think about it every day. I don't want to die. She continued crying. I hugged my sister and tried to comfort her. Honestly, I'd never thought about what would happen if one of the other children turned 18. The thought that Katie would die gave me a devastating feeling. I didn't even want to entertain the idea. That evening I wanted to have dinner with all of us together. Katie managed to cook one of the last chickens we had on the farm. We were going to save it for Christmas dinner but I felt like we needed to come together after recent events and give thanks for the fact we were all still alive and healthy. Dinner was quiet, and I felt love for the first time for my new family. It wasn't conventional, but as I looked around the room at everyone, I'd become close to all of them for different reasons. I sat there and decided now would be the perfect time for a story. A happy tale, nothing sad or scary. I recall the story about a dragon that breathed fire burning down an entire village in one great fiery storm. In one instance, an entire town was obliterated. Then out of the ashes was born a new place. At first it was dead, and it looked like the earth would never be green again. But the people began to see that the dragon wasn't killing them. He was trying to create a new world, fresh with no mistakes in it. And maybe that's what happened when we came to be in this place. Maybe that's why we are here now. In the story, the sky was always blue and the sun was always shining. Everyone was happy, except those that still hated the dragon. They had it out for the dragon for burning their village and had a hard time seeing all the good that had come from the newly created sacred space. Let's not be like those townspeople. Let's be grateful we are still here. We have each other, I said, grabbing Katie's hand, and she smiled a tiny smile at me, and then looked at Tara. He's right, Tara said. We should be grateful that we have each other. That night, we all peacefully went to our rooms, and I slept better than I had in two years. Two weeks went by, and Katie's birthday came and went with no issue. The weather seemed to get better, too. There was a warmth in the air, and the children had stopped feeling so afraid. I saw a peaking of green grass, even though it was nearing the end of October. We began to find food easier than before, and I wondered if it had anything to do with my story of the dragon renewing the land. I couldn't deny it seemed odd, but it was a coincidence, right? Then something happened after one happily uneventful evening. I'd been reading a book on how to identify herbs in nature when I fell asleep. The book still upon my chest as my head rolled over onto it. And that was the last thing I remember. I felt it first, the pain. I couldn't see it, but I knew I was gushing blood. There was no one in the room with me, but I had been attacked. I was having trouble breathing. I couldn't see well because of the blood, but I felt sunlight on me. Then I felt my body being dragged across the ground. Someone kicked me in my side, and then I heard Tara. How does it feel, demon? Tara asked with another kick. What's going on? I managed to speak ever so barely. I felt someone come and wipe the blood from my eyes. It was Katie. 
She had tears falling from her eyes. Who are you? Katie was pleading more than questioning. Ian, your brother, I said, confused. You aren't my brother, Katie said defiantly. My brother is dead too. What are you talking about? I sat up, but someone kicked me again. I looked over. It was Henry. I began to feel angry instead of confused, and managed to sit up, blocking any more blows with my left arm. Stop this now! I'm your brother! Who else would I be? One of the creatures that live in the trees, Tony's voice said, but I couldn't see him. They're demons. They eat kids. That's why he's here. He's saving us for his next meal. Why are you coming up with this nonsense? You told those stories, and then those same things started happening, Katie said. Katie, tell him what happened to you last night, Tara urged. I was getting ready for bed when I looked at my feet. They were turning snow white. I'm dying just like Mum and Dad, just like every other adult, except for you. Slit his throat so he can't tell any more stories, Tara urged Katie. Katie had a knife in her hand, but she couldn't do it. Tell me, Ian, what happened the day the white light came and snuffed out our world? You always said you were in the car with your friends. Why didn't you die? What happened? I told you before, we were in the car with Curtis and Tyler, grabbing a bite to eat, and this bright light appeared. It was so bright, it lit up the sky, and you couldn't see anything for a few moments. Then, the next thing I recall, I was home. No, they got into a horrible car accident. The light kept Joe from seeing, and they were in a head-on collision. You were the only survivor walking away without even a scratch. Everyone knew it, except for you. Mum and Dad didn't want to remind you to save you from the trauma. But then, they died. I guess I'm just lucky. I'm not, Katie said, showing me the white streak of hair she now had. One of her green eyes was now turning white. I knew in a few hours, or a few days, my sister would succumb to the disease. If only one of us can be alive, then you have to die, because I don't want to die, Ian. Kill him, Tara said. Please, don't. I love you, Katie, I said. His fear overtook me. It can't wait. It's what I've been training you all for, since the beginning. Kill him! Tara yelled. My mind flashed to her survivor lessons. They'd planned this all along. Anger was now overtaking my fear of death. And then, after the children attacked Ian, they realized he could not die. I said telling them a final story to save my own life. Instead, he healed within moments of the attack. He rose and looked upon the children, and realized that his biggest weakness was that he had a heart. And so he killed it. When he killed it, he could feel no pain for the bloodshed he was about to inflict. I looked at Katie and the others as my body did indeed begin to heal. I walked towards them as they were all now afraid of me. I felt like the devil himself. <laughs> I told you to slit his throat, and now look at what you did, you stupid bitch. Tara was now running away from me, and Katie stood, tears in her eyes. Katie, say goodbye to your brother one last time before I let it take me over. I grabbed her in a fierce hug knowing I would never see her again. I'm so sorry, Ian. She held on to me for dear life. Go now. I can feel it. If you don't, I'm going to snap your neck. She ran from me then. And as she did, when she was out of ear range, I whispered, Katie went on to live a happy and full life. And there was no more disease in the world. And everyone went on to live a full adult life. And Ian's heart remained intact. I walked back to the house and sat in the corridor.
I was still covered in blood, trying to recall how I'd ended up here. After all, some of the children were still out there, hunting and gathering, unbeknownst to them what had happened. I had to wait so I could tell them goodbye. I remember why, I said out loud to myself. Then I suddenly found myself again, and recalled with fierce veracity why I remained alive when the diseases rattled the earth with death. I was the creator. I took that young man's body over. He deserved so much more in life. He became my vessel. I was, after all, the Alpha and the Omega. I always said I'd destroy the world again, but it would not be in flood or fire. There were still some kinks to work out with this world, however. Like greed, jealousy, and fear seem innate inside of the human race. I'd find a way to fix it for good. After all, I had before. My mum's death came unexpectedly during a stressful Christmas season. At the ripe old age of 27, she collapsed in the kitchen from an apparent heart attack, leaving behind this world and her six-year-old son. I remember her arguing with my grandpa, though what they discussed was beyond what my young mind could comprehend. Ah, it's sad old stuff. They simply responded as I asked. The three of us lived together, my mum, my grandpa and myself, seeing as my father left long before I was born. Leaving nothing behind but a note saying he wasn't ready for children, running off and never looking back. In his absence, grandpa had stepped in, taking his place as a father figure. Well, he must have been in his late seventies by the time I was born, though none of us knew for certain because he'd always joke about the answer whenever asked. But, even with his advancing age, he never took a day off, always working to provide for the family. Despite the sudden onset of her sickness, my mum didn't die immediately. They managed to keep her alive for a week in the hospital, and they worked around the clock to keep her going, doing their best to figure out what had caused her heart to suddenly give up. She spent the remainder of her life in a coma, and I kept her company for as long as I could. My grandpa would take care of me while we waited for her to pass, making sure I ate, and just sitting by my side as I held my mother's hand, desperately wishing for her to come back to me. On the day of her death, my mother briefly regained consciousness, only awaking to look deep into my eyes, staring intently into my soul, as if she was letting me know everything would be all right. She reached out her hand, Grabbing onto mine tightly, I felt a surge of energy flowing through my body, one filled with pure love and joy, making the hairs on my arms stand up. During that split second, our souls merged for the briefest of moments, and something that had existed within my mother was passed over to me. And then, as quickly as it had begun, it faded away, and my mother fell silent in her bed an ominous beep filling the room as doctors and nurses rushed to her aid. Well, they did what they could to bring her back for a second time, but in the end, she was a lost cause. Following her death, Grandpa took me out for burgers and a milkshake. It was a tradition that had started years prior, when he discovered that pretty much any time I felt sad, it could be remedied, or at least helped, with a burger and a strawberry milkshake. Though it was just a minor act of kindness, one that couldn't ease the fact of my mum's death, it brought me a sense of normalcy, briefly taking away the feeling that the world had just ended. Two weeks passed, and the funeral had been arranged. 
We didn't have much family to speak of, but my mum was a well-liked person at work, with plenty of friends who showed up to pay their final respects. I'd seen a few of them before. Her boss, Mr. Roberts, and her best friends. But as a kid, I didn't feel all that comfortable around people who were essentially strangers, and it took me a while to get used to them. And I stood by Grandpa, holding onto his hand tightly, as different people spoke a few words. I listened intently to the stories they told, and thought about my own favourite memories. Then, as I looked up to see the next speaker take the stand, I saw something surrounding all the guests. It was vague at first, hardly noticeable at all, but as people got closer to me, I noticed a clear outline hanging around them, clinging on to each and every person at the funeral like an aura radiating out from their bodies, varying in both intensity and emotion. While most were gleaming with strong, brilliant auras, spreading around the church with a sense of hope and joy, others looked darker, feeling more pitiful and empty, as if their life force was simply lacking or spread too thin. Among the weak ones, Mr. Roberts stood out with his pitch-black aura, his energy paling in comparison to the rest, full of despair and a bizarre feeling of intense agony. Uh, he'd looked miserable since the beginning of the funeral, but until then I'd assumed it to be due to the circumstances. But now I noticed he carried himself in a strange way. Each step he took was a struggle. I turned to my grandpa, who also had a magnificent aura surrounding him. He immediately noticed that something was bothering me, and quickly got me out of there without asking any question. I wanted to tell him what I'd seen right then and there, but something within me made me keep quiet, as if telling him would be wrong, and that I had to carry the burden on my own. The vision faded as soon as we'd left the funeral, and my grandpa assumed that the mass of people and the sombre atmosphere was just too much for me. We went home, and I thought that would be the end of it, until a few days later when I overheard Grandpa on the phone mentioning that Mr. Roberts had passed away suddenly, and that he'd sent flowers since he'd meant a great deal to my mum. Even at a young age, I was able to connect the dots, and realised his horrible aura at the funeral meant he had been only a few days away from death. Years passed and the vision had become little more than a distant childhood memory to be ignored. I started school and lived a relatively normal life. Though a bit of a loner who kept quiet, and without a large family, I was more or less happy. My grandpa took it upon himself to teach me all the important aspects of life, from cooking, washing, reading and math, to well, more personal issues such as love and respect. As an avid hunter, he even took me along once, teaching me about gun safety and such. After a couple of sessions, we both realised it wasn't for me, but I appreciated the effort nonetheless. For all intents and purposes, he was my father. Nevertheless, I kept calling him Grandpa, and he never seemed to mind. The next vision would come to me on the school bus. I sat in my designated seat and listened to music, just doing my best to ignore all the noise around me, as we slowly made our way to class. As I glanced up, I suddenly noticed the same beautiful aura I'd seen so many years ago, now surrounding all the other kids on the bus, everyone full of hope, unique and magnificent in their own way. Well, everyone except for Lucy. Lucy suffered from leukemia, which, at the time, I didn't understand the severity of. My immature brain still not realising that death could strike anyone at any moment, regardless of age. Her aura was weak. Though not rid of all life force, it had definitely diminished to the point where she was standing on death's doorstep. Lucy was sick, and it had been showing for quite some time. Despite her illness, she kept her great attitude and eternal optimism. 
Though she was more of an introvert, she was well-liked, but, well, kids are immature, and since her diagnosis, many had shied away in fear of her sickness. Knowing exactly what her aura meant, I decided to sit next to her, just to keep her company while she slowly inched towards the end of her life. We started talking, and to my surprise we had a lot in common. Daily bus rides together turned into daily lunches, and before long we became good friends. During the following months, we spent pretty much every day together, hanging out after school, watching movies, talking about our hopes and desires. She confessed a lot of her inner secrets during our talks, that death wasn't something she'd been prepared for, and that she was horrified of what came after. Then she told me she'd never kissed anyone before, which at the age of 13 wasn't a big deal. Neither of us had had any relationship experience, but in her case she feared she would miss out on a lot of important milestones in life. Well, it was through Lucy I learned that with the appropriate amount of focus, I could actually lock in on individual people's aura. Rather than having uncontrolled bouts of my visions, which left me exhausted and confused, I could see each person's aura as I interacted with them. Her aura kept fading as the disease took its course. But despite the vanishing life force, the quality seemed just slightly better. Rather than the dull energy I'd seen on the bus the first day we spoke, there was a glimmer of joy hidden beneath. And even though I couldn't say for certain, I like to think I made a positive impact. As her birthday came around, I brought her chocolate, flowers, and a dinner invitation. A proper date that had been part of her bucket list for the longest time, and I fully intended to make the best of it. We ate at an Italian restaurant, and with our exquisite taste in food, we naturally ordered pizzas. The dinner was followed by a movie. Her pick was horror, which, for whatever bizarre reason, had always been her favourite. The movie itself wasn't anything beyond average. As we grew tired and started leaning on each other, I felt truly content with life. Well, I'd almost fallen asleep by the time the movie ended, and just as we lifted our tired heads and turned towards each other, a spark ignited, and we shared our first kiss. It was the purest and genuinely one of the happiest moments in my life. Even when the kiss itself wasn't the best, being her first and mine as well, oh, our friendship had, over the course of a year, flourished into something deeper. One of the most beautiful years of my life, only to be immediately followed by one of the worst. Lucy never wanted to die in a hospital. In her mind, an unexpected death at home would have been better than a drawn-out month in hospice care, full of suffering before her body finally gave out. We both just turned 14, and I'd come to pick her up for a walk in the snow-filled park during a particularly cold winter. As I arrived, her mother invited me in, explaining that Lucy was getting ready for our date. I knocked on the door, once, twice, and yet she didn't respond. Having seen her weakening aura for the better part of a year, I quickly spiralled into panic. Without hesitation, I barged in to see her lying on the bed, looking as if she was just sleeping, but her aura had completely vanished. No pulse, no breathing. Lucy had died quickly and peacefully from an embolism, or why she waited for our day. Honestly, it wasn't the death on its own that haunted me the most. We'd all expected it, and thus made the most of the short time we'd had together. What truly tore a hole in my heart was the empty seat on the bus, serving as a constant reminder that Lucy was gone, that I had once again outlived one of the most important people in my life. My grandpa was naturally just as distraught as myself, and, as he'd always done ever since I was a kid, he took me out for burgers and a strawberry milkshake. We talked, and laughed, and I admitted my feelings for Lucy, who'd 
being my first unofficial girlfriend. Then, just for a moment, with all the emotions brought on by reminiscing, and just mentioning her, gave me another vision. I hadn't intended for it, but I unintentionally got a glimpse of my grandpa's order, and I saw that it had rapidly diminished into a bleak version of its former self. Grandpa, are you feeling all right? I asked as a reflex. He gave me a peculiar look before answering. Yeah, of course, kiddo. A bit tired, but I'm as good as ever, he said, with a smile on his face. But it didn't feel real. There was something unsettling behind his cheerful facade, as if he knew exactly what I'd seen, but his time on Earth was a limited resource. Time takes its toll, and there's not a single person in this world strong enough to withstand its ever-present tide. Grandpa's once bright and fantastic aura had turned dull, and his time would soon come. At that point, I still hadn't told anyone about my gift. Not that it would have mattered, as death would always be an inevitable part of life, one people would rather keep as a surprise. Instead, I decided to spend as much time with him as possible, just as I'd done with Lucy. Naturally, he was ecstatic to have me around more, though a bit confused to my newfound, clingy behaviour. How old are you, anyway? I asked him during one of our many lunches. <laughs> I'm a hundred and five chuckled. Another false number like he always came. A few nights later, just as I'd fallen over the edge into the realm of dreams, I was abruptly awoken by sounds down in the garage. I carefully peeked out through the window to see our car pull away from the driveway, quickly leaving the street. I snuck down, to find that my grandpa had gone missing. I tried calling him, but it went straight to voicemail. And then I sat nervously in the kitchen, staring out the window as I awaited his return. Once a couple of hours had passed, I was about ready to call the police. But just as I picked up the phone, he came driving back, parking the car down the street and walking the rest in an attempt at being quiet. As he opened the door, I immediately noticed something that should have been reassuring but instead it sent a dreadful shiver down my spine. In the brief two hours that he'd been gone, his aura had grown stronger. Not stronger in the sense that the quality had improved, or even changed, but his actual life force had increased as if he'd, well, as if he'd gone back several decades in time. Where were you? I blurted out as he walked past the kitchen. Oh, Hey, kiddo, I didn't realize you were still awake, he stuttered. I, um, yeah, I just went to the pub. I needed time to think. I didn't mean to wake you. Think about what? Oh, I haven't been feeling myself lately. Just needed to get some thoughts in order. At that point, his mysterious disappearance gave way to a hint of anger. And you were drinking and driving? Just half a beer. Oh, I'd never drive in pair. He walked over and hugged me, promising that everything was all right. And without any further explanation, he said he needed to sleep. Oh, maybe I was naive and should have dug deeper, but at the time I blindly accepted his explanation, and that was that. A few years passed. My grandpa remained his strong, hard-working self. I myself had just turned 18 years of age, which meant I was legally an adult, and had successfully sent out a bunch of college applications to be rejected while I worked part-time. Each year I'd made a tradition out of visiting both my mother's and Lucy's graves on their respective birthdays. I never felt like I'd gotten closure following my mother's death, with the doctors failing to explain what had killed her at such a young age. I put flowers on their graves and spoke to them for an hour, hoping they'd found peace on the other side. Even without being particularly religious, it helped me cope with the loss. In the meantime, it seemed my grandpa had developed a ritual of his own, 
Or maybe it was one I just hadn't noticed before. Over time his aura kept growing weaker, and, as it did, he would disappear for a couple of days at least once a year, blaming either on a business trip or old friends, only to return with an aura as strong as ever. Since I'd learned to control my ability, I'd seen auras come in all shapes and forms, but never had I seen someone with a fluctuating aura, and with his biannual disappearing acts, I started to grow suspicious. After some contemplation, I decided to follow him. To prepare for the eventual stalking, I kept a close eye on his constantly diminishing aura, knowing that once it reached a certain point, he'd leave on one of his trips. December quickly rolled around, and he made the excuse that he had to visit an old friend who had fallen ill earlier in the year. With my part-time job, I'd finally saved up enough money for a car, and in the snowy weather, following him discreetly proved to be an easy enough task. He drove a couple of hours over to the next town, and eventually pulled into a street leading to a run-down neighbourhood. I observed him from afar, and made sure I'd park my own car on the next street over. I quickly sprinted over to follow him on foot while he waited outside the door to an old house. After what felt like an eternity, he knocked a second, and then a third time. Once the door opened, he was greeted by a man in his late eighties, too frail to keep upright without the support of his cane, and his aura was just as feeble. He took one look at my grandpa, sighed, and invited him inside. Well, I snuck over to one of the windows and watched them walk into the kitchen. They sat themselves down around a table without speaking a word, and the old man poured them both a tall glass of whiskey. While my grandpa didn't touch his drink, the old man instantly chugged his down in one large gulp before snatching the other glass. How'd you find me? the man finally asked. My grandpa responded quietly, inaudible through the window. And now you've come to collect what little life I have left, huh? All so you can keep on living for another hundred years, he said matter-of-factly, without the faintest hint of surprise or fear. Grandpa didn't respond. He just sat quietly and stared at the man. Well, I'm half dead anyway. No point fighting it. Any last wishes, Jane? How about fuck you? I should have killed you when I had the chance, the man said as he chugged his second glass of whiskey. He slammed his empty glass down on the table and stared into Grandpa's eyes. <sighs> Get on with it then. After a short moment of intense silence and the two men staring each other down, my Grandpa reached out his hand, grabbing the old man by his arm. The man instantly froze in place, and his angry expression was replaced by one of intense agony. He tried to pull his arm free, but his muscles were paralysed by the grip. He could do nothing but watch as his own life force drained. <sighs> Fuck you, he let out one last time. Within the span of ten seconds, his aura had completely vanished and he fell over dead on the table. All the while, my grandpa's aura improved ever so slightly. I slumped down on the ground in shock, horrified by what I'd just witnessed, heartbroken by the fact that the only person I'd relied on since the death of my mother was a murderer. As I heard my grandfather open the door, I quickly ducked out of sight around a corner, where I patiently waited for him to leave. Once I heard his car drive away, I darted into the house to the man's aid, frantically trying to call an ambulance. It felt like hours had passed between dialing the number and the ambulance arriving, and be it out of morbid curiosity or the need to figure out how to prevent more deaths, I went searching through the house for answers. The two of them had clearly known each other, and if I was lucky, maybe I could get answers. 
His mail read, Gordon Lewis, which didn't match what my grandfather had called him, so I figured it could be a fake name. I kept digging through closets, drawers and wardrobes, desperate to find any information at all before the paramedics arrived. As I rummaged through his bedroom, I noticed a box stuffed under his bed marked Charles Bishop. I opened the box to find newspaper clippings and several bundles of pictures. Some of the older, more worn-out photos were sepia-toned and pictured a middle-aged man holding a ring-necked pheasant he'd hunted, alongside a smiling kid diligently holding onto a rifle. The date on the photo read January 17, 1939, and the back read Charles and James Bishop, first hunting session. The pictures were all dated in the late 30s and early 40s, and as I studied them, I realized that the man bore a striking resemblance to my grandfather. I grabbed another bundle that seemed to contain pictures from the 70s, and the same man, albeit slightly older, appeared in most of the photographs. It was, without an ounce of doubt, my grandfather, except in the span of the past 80 years he'd barely aged. Most of the newspaper clippings held stories about mysterious deaths and murders throughout the 20th century, while the rest were just obituaries. At the bottom of the box, I pulled out a much newer photograph, one with the date October 10th, 1992. I almost dropped it in shock when I realized, well, that I'd seen the photo before. It was one of our own family pictures, just my mother, my grandfather and myself as an infant. I quickly shuffled through the photos again to make a basic timeline. The man who had raised me, who I had called Grandpa for the better part of my life, had to be, at the very least, over a century old. As the ambulance arrived with his blaring siren, I collected some photos from the box and met them at the door. A couple of paramedics barged in while a police officer started questioning me about what I'd seen. At first glance, the murder scene didn't look suspicious at all, just a heart attack that I'd happened to witness. Part of me desperately wanted to tell them about my grandfather, that I'd seen him suck the life out of this poor old man, but I knew that it would more than likely put me in a psychiatric institution, and that if he ever figured out that I'd accused him, he might come after me. So I made my own plan to bring him down. Once I drove home, I snuck in through the garage, which led into a back room where we stored our hunting equipment. I grabbed one of the rifles, figuring that if I were to confront him, I should at least have the chance to defend myself. I quietly made my way into the kitchen, to find my grandfather sipping on a glass of whiskey, visibly distraught. Without letting him notice me, I put the rifle down behind the corner and placed myself in the doorway, a safe distance from him. As he noticed me, he tried to shake off his miserable demeanour and quickly put on a fake smile. Oh, hey, kiddo. Didn't see you there. Where have you been? He said, trying to sound casual. Speechless, I just threw the bundle of pictures onto the table. He took one glance and immediately recognized them. Where'd you find these? He asked nervously. I saw you, with that man, was all I managed to get out before the words froze in my throat. With the context provided, he didn't need to ask what I meant. He knew he'd been caught red-handed. I followed you today, to that house, where you... The words froze in my throat. He stood up from his chair, wearing a worried expression on his face as he walked towards me. It's really not what it looks like, he started saying. Before he could reach me, I grabbed the rifle and pointed it directly at his chest. Whoa, uh, what are you doing? Just stay the fuck away from me. I saw how you killed that man, I shouted on the brink of tears. He started backing away with his hands raised. No, please, you don't understand. Look, just, just put the gun down. I kept the rifle pointed at him with trembling hands, 
as he backed into a corner, almost falling over. I saw the photos. I saw how you kill people to stay alive, I said. He froze in place as I inched closer. How many have you killed? No, it's not like that. They, they weren't good people. I, I wouldn't. I, I... Whether it was the intense emotion of that moment, or if it was just the next stage in my developing ability, I don't know. But something about his aura changed, as if the hundreds of souls he'd stolen started to split apart. Enough for me to recognize each individual person he'd killed. Hundreds of lives sacrificed, only to give him a few extra years on Earth. Though the vast majority of them were strangers I didn't know, I recognized the old man he'd killed. And I saw one that sent shivers down my spine. My mother. I chose them specifically because they hurt others. Please, you have to believe me. He begged as I snapped back to attention. My mother. You. You killed her. I said, with barely a whisper. Well, she, she threatened to stop me. I tried to talk her out of it, but she wouldn't listen. I'm, I'm sorry. He tried to approach me again, but I quickly pressed him back. Are you going to kill me? He asked in terror. I thought about it for a moment. A part of me desperately wanted to pull the trigger, to avenge my mother. Unfortunately, I couldn't separate the monster that stood before me from the man that had raised me, a person I still loved and cared for. No, but I am going to call the police, I said as confidently as I could. I picked up the phone to call the police, looking away for a split second. Stop that, my grandfather shouted as he grabbed onto my rifle, trying to snatch it away from me. As I tried to get it back, I pulled too hard on the trigger, accidentally firing off a shot that hit him straight in his chest. He let go, and without speaking another word, he fell, dead before he even hit the ground. Following the shot, my memory went hazy. I vaguely remember dialing the number, the paramedics showing up along with the police. They asked me several questions, but in the end it was deemed an accident, and with the various aliases the police found linked to my grandfather, no charges were pressed against me. He'd lived an extraordinarily long life, at the cost of others. Whether most of the people he killed deserved it or not, I don't know. But I'm certain he didn't do it to better the world. As for me, nothing has been the same following my grandfather's death. Not only because I've been left alone by everyone I ever loved, but because, as his life drained from his ancient body, our powers merged into one. And while he knew how to control it, for me, it's something that will always lurk in the background. I can no longer stay too close to people, because the more time I spend with them, the more I passively drain their life force, stealing it unwillingly as their aura slowly grows weak. Maybe I can learn to control it, or maybe this is my grandfather's punishment for killing him. Whatever the case, in a twisted turn of events, I've been given the choice between living forever while those around me die a premature death or to fade away alone. I've already made my choice. No one will get hurt because of me, so I will observe from afar, letting people know when their time is near in the hopes that they'll make the best of what they have left. In the end, it's not the time we're given that matters but what we do with it that makes life worthwhile.
today. Justin sat in the back of the large employee conference room, one of those with the panels that can be in place or removed to make the room larger or smaller as needed. It was medium for the current presentation. The training session was mandatory, but only so many drones could be released from their cubicles and still have enough left to complete the mindless daily tasks of their existences. One of the fun parts about working for the large corporations, he thought, was the homogenous training session. The participants had already listened ad nauseum to the biannual sessions on sexual harassment and workforce misconduct. The same films every other year for the past ten. This afternoon, though, they had a new subject, at least for their organization. Active threats. The speaker was from a state police agency and had been part of their tactical response team for several years. It was pretty engaging and the material was interesting. Well, we can relate the basic responses, run, hide, fight, to the basic survival responses. Run is flight. If we can get away from the threat, we should, and we should bring as many others with us as possible. Hide is the same as freeze. Stay in place. Hide. Turn out the lights. Be silent. Mute or turn off electronics and hope that the threat passes. And if all else fails, fight and do our best to take out the threat. Now, the key to any of these basic tactics is to commit. He said the last word very emphatically, and increased his volume just enough to wake up anyone who'd had started to nod off after a carbohydrate-rich lunch. He didn't spend too much time on statistics, which was refreshing. He instead focused on how to spy a threat and the order of priority. Oh, people are always the biggest threat. There's a reason we're top of the food chain. Well, except for diseases. <laughs> yes, laughter there. He went on about other ways to be prepared. Work together to figure out plans for what to do in your workspace, including break rooms, yeah, and consider what threats may arise and whether they are imminent. If something is out of the ordinary, say something. Above all, be alert and look alert. That was good stuff and relative to recent news events, but something about sitting in a chair... Listening to other people speak was very draining. When the session wrapped for the day, Justin was exhausted and ready to go home. The classes had lasted for the full day, so it was 5pm and the rush was on to get out of the city and back to the burbs. It had snowed the night before, and although the roads were clear, there were already patches of ice in the shadows cast by downtown structures. Naturally, some goofball had had to cause a crash while most drivers are still well inside the city. He was stuck for a good half hour before he was able to get onto an exit, and then for another ten minutes before he could attempt a different route. The GPS on his phone was slow, but hey, have a good day, and the drive home was bound to present some level of misery. He'd hoped to wait until he got closer to home to refill the fuel tank, but the forty minutes he'd sat in traffic had drained more of his tank than he'd planned. Well, he knew he'd have to pay more in the urban neighbourhoods, but he had little choice. He turned on a street that ran in the general direction he needed to go and saw the yellow glow of cheap outdoor lighting at a corner convenience store. It was already dark, so he couldn't see much of the area, but knew it was only marginally sketchy, or had been a few years past when he last had to dodge a crash on the same stretch of freeway. Justin truly hated driving inside the city, off the freeways. The constant traffic lights and stop signs made it a dangerous labyrinth of cross-traffic and insane drivers. He had to dodge around one small car that inexplicably slowed to a near stop. No brake lights. It was just suddenly in the road and stopped. Well, fortunately, he had already started slowing to turn into the filling station. As he passed the little car, he saw a young woman, a girl really, sitting behind the wheel, texting. He rolled his eyes and griped. <laughs> Figures. Wouldn't want to pay attention to the road when there's a critical text from your idiot friend. Miss Stuck on Stupid. He pulled up to the pump and took a look to see if there was any sign of an illegal scanner. That was one of the safety tips he'd learned that day. Then he paid with his card and set the pump lock while he texted to let his wife know he'd be late, but he was on his way. She sent back a standard, no prob. Please be careful. 
The pump clicked off very suddenly, and he knew that it hadn't gone long enough to even fill half a tank. He set the phone down on top of his medium-sized SUV and used the grip on the pump handle to finish pumping the gas. Oh, it was pumping slowly. The station's tank must have been getting low. As he gripped and re-gripped, cursing under his breath at the pump, he caught a chill. A feeling of malevolence and danger creeping up from behind. He looked over his shoulder, and there was nothing. Just some hood rat driving by blasting out window-rattling bass from his POS ride. Ah, he thought. Speakers are probably worth more than the car. He looked forward at the door of the convenience store and saw the source of the danger vibe. Two men wearing dark hoodies and shades barreled out of the doorway towards a late 90s looking yellowish Pontiac with several spots of both grey and red primer at various points on the body. The second one through the door looked up at him and they locked eyes. Well, Justin's locked on the robbers. He thought the robbers were locked back, though all he could see were the large, dark lenses of his shades. Well, the momentary shock of making direct eye contact with a witness made Denarius angry, and he pointed his pistol at the fore. <sighs> Mind your business, asshole, he screeched. The other runner stopped before he climbed into the waiting Pontiac. <sighs> What's the matter, D? Oh, great, Justin thought. Now he had two robbers, no, three, the driver had turned her eyes toward him, all staring in his direction and pointing various levels of firepower. He froze. We didn't know what to do. There was no place to hide. And he was absolutely terrified. And then D aimed at the cover for the gas kiosk, next to Justin's head, and fired a round. He held a small thirty-eight caliber revolver, but it looked enormous to Justin at that time, and the sharp crack sounded like the roar of a cannon. Well, that did it. Time to run. He dropped the pump grip, dove into the SUV and started the engine. He was gone in seconds, leaving the crooks to leap into their own car and leave the property. His heart had leapt into his throat and his pulse was pounding. He drove forward as quickly as he could manage until a red light up ahead caused him to brake. He looked in the mirrors and saw the Pontiac leave the convenience store lot, turn toward him and approach from behind. He thumped on the steering wheel in fear and frustration, and as soon as the light turned, he laid on the horn to get the person in the car in front of him to move. He saw the silhouette of a hand flipping him the bird as the jerk pulled slowly forward. He tried to change lanes to pass him, but the jerk cut in front. Justin was in a newer, nicer vehicle, well, he knew that jerk face knew that he wouldn't risk running into the jerky beater. He checked the mirrors again. Oh, crap. The Pontiac was creeping up behind him. He took the first left available down a side street. The beater driver honked at him as he continued forward in the jerkmobile. Justin cut across the oncoming traffic and onto a neighborhood street. He desperately checked the mirrors again. Maybe he could turn again and lose the Pontiac. Oh, no. There they were again on his tail and closing fast. He ran a few stop signs and hoped that a cop would be there to stop him. Nope, again. Apparently they had better things to do than patrol the rough parts of town. Not a police car in sight. After a few more blocks, he whipped to the right, down another street. He immediately had to slow because so many vehicles were parked along each side of the street. If even one car tried to come toward him on this narrow roadway, they'd have to stop, and one of them would have to cram into one of the narrow driveways on either side to let the other pass, or back down the street through a gauntlet of parked cars. He didn't care, though. His mind was on running, and he made the next left and hoped that it would offer a wider path. It did, but only slightly. The nightmare twists and turns went on for a while, until he was completely lost. Yet when he finally worked up the nerve and looked behind, there were no ultra-bright headlights. The Pontiac was long gone. The initial adrenaline dump had jolted his heart, and the chase he'd imagined had kept his pulse beating rapidly. He gulped in air and tried to calm himself. He needed to get his bearings. 
he'd end up in an area that was an old industrial park. Many of the plants and warehouses had been shut down for years. He turned into the first driveway that was open. As soon as he completed the turn, he switched off his headlights and looked for a safe place to hide. It was time to hide for a while and assess the situation. He was able to pull in between a building and a rusted shipping container. He hoped there'd be no rails or broken glass under the light cover of snow. He looked at the dash and saw that the check engine light was activated. The fuel gauge read that he had just under a half tank of gas. He stepped out and crunched a couple of steps to the gas cap, put it in place. He knew that the check engine indicator light would reset when he turned the engine off and then back on. He chanced to peek around the shipping container and saw no one on the dark roadway that weaved through the plants and warehouses near the river. He decided he had time to make a call. Oh, crap. Dang it. Oh, crap. He shouted as he realized that he'd left his phone on the roof of the SUV at the gas station. He stomped around behind his vehicle for a while, cursing himself in frustration. That phone was gone. It likely lay crushed on some street in the hood. He took a few breaths. No way to get help, and no way to navigate. Well, he no longer had his old city key map book. No, he had GPS on his phone. Who needed the clutter of actual maps? He was feeling very cold and a bit dejected. So he climbed back inside the warm interior of his SUV and sat for a moment. He felt that it was probably safe to continue. The Pontiac and the murderous gang were long gone, doubtless enjoying the fruits of their little outing and laughing at the stupid suburbanite and how he'd lightly soared himself. Mission successful, witness intimidated. He considered his options. He could simply drive until he came to the river that wound through the industrial park. He knew a few streets that crossed canals that led to the river. That would be even faster. He'd find a familiar street soon enough. He relaxed and put his car in drive. Time to get home to his Ashley and their kiddos, and even the goofy schnauzer they'd adopted from the shelter. He rolled further into the park district, but instead of the human-produced lights getting brighter, they got dimmer, and he saw that many of the street lights were out or missing. He crossed a few canals, but none of the streets around them had names he recognised. Well, he was still hopeful he'd find something familiar, when the engine began to clunk and sputter. He kept going, hoping it was just knocking for the cheap gas from that crappy hood station, but it finally coughed its last breath and died. It was hard to turn the wheel with the power steering off, but he managed to get over to the side of the roadway. He flipped on the hazard lights. Not that there'd been any other traffic for a while, but it was the right thing to do when one's nice vehicle becomes a road hazard. He used the fob to try to start the engine again, but it wouldn't come to life and the check engine light remained a glowing reminder that he wasn't going anywhere. The roadway was wide. It had been made for big trucks and vans and it was fairly level. There was a driveway about another 20 yards ahead, so he decided to try and push his lump of plastic, metal and rubber out of the way in case anyone decided to drive down this darkened roadway. So it was empty. Closed plants on a cold, dark night with a far cast of more snow. Well, he had to suppress a shiver from the creepiness rather than the cold. The electronics still worked, so he was able to get the steering wheel unlocked and after a grunting, straining start, got the thing moving and made an awkward turn into the next lot. He managed to get the SUV into a space beside the gateway. Fortunately, the uh, gate consisted of a chain currently snaked on the ground across the driveway. Many businesses use them as an inexpensive way to stop trespassers from driving into their lots after hours. Maybe the place was open, or had a security guard or something. Maybe even a phone, so he could get a tow. The parking lots in the area were all still lit, a testament to the wastefulness of city government, and yet a comfort to him at the moment. His host dwindled as he approached the big plant and warehouse complex. There were no lights shining through the windows in, in what looked to be the office portion for what the sign proclaimed was Tillantia Enterprises Incorporated. The entire area had a stench to it. 
It was on the downwind side of the city for a reason. He approached the windows anyway and looked inside. Just some scraps of paper and some ancient looking furniture. He decided to get a better view of the area and walked toward the other end of the large building that faced the roadway. As he looked around the corner toward the back, he could barely see anything. The building lights were all out and the parking area lights were dim and the ones that were working were even more sparse than the street lights. He let his eyes adjust for a moment and made out a set of stairs that clung to the outside wall above a side entrance. He cautiously stepped forward. Oh, who knows what kind of junk is on the ground at a place like this, he thought gloomily. He made it to the stairwell and checked it with a good shake. There were some rattles from above, but nothing that made a climb seem too precarious. So he took the chance. The metal of the railing was freezing, and his light gloves didn't do much to help protect his hands. He made it up several flights and was again facing the back of the building. The air had freshened into a breeze, and he shivered with cold as it penetrated his office-style slacks, dress shirt and blazer. Yeah, he'd have to retrieve his top coat from the SUV. He could make out a line of trees at the back of the property, and a shining ribbon behind them that had to be the river. There were lights, and even a few cars passing along the other side. Great civilization, he mentally celebrated as he made his way back to Terra Firma. All he had to do was figure out where the next bridge was. It may even have been the primary one he'd pictured on his mental map. As he let go of the rusted rail, it let out a deep, ringing gong sound, and the lower part of the structure rattled like it was providing a warning of some kind. He was stopped, and a chill hit him that didn't involve the temperature. It was more profound than the one at the filling station. This one left him shivering in both cold and fright. He gazed into the poorly lit surroundings, and then saw a double glint of light near the back of the building towards the tree line and river. In other circumstances, he'd assume that the glints were from eyes, but they were too big and too high off the ground for a person. He thought that maybe it was just some object that had caught and reflected the meagre light, or maybe even something on or across the river that shone through the lifeless trees. And then, the eyes blinked. It wasn't a twinkle of reflected light. This was lids briefly closing over eyes. Another shiver took him, and he started to step backwards toward the front of the building, and what light there was, and to his automobile. The eyes moved forward slightly, and slitted. He turned and fled like a madman toward the SUV. At first... He would have sworn that he heard large, pounding footsteps giving chase. But when he made it back to the driver's side door, he chanced to look back and saw that nothing had followed. Ah, he sat in the vehicle for a while. It was getting really cold outside and the wind had picked up a little. He thought about it. His nerves were certainly strained and that dark area had been pretty spooky. Maybe he just conjured up ice in his distressed state of mind. Well, he was justifiably paranoid about being chased after the earlier events of this evening. Once he convinced himself that it was his imagination and not a scary monster in the dark, he started thinking about what to do next. Maybe he could hold out until morning, and maybe someone would drive by and see him. About that time, small flakes of snow began to settle on the windshield. Well, he'd be covered and camouflaged long before morning. He regretted now that he hadn't renewed his vehicle tracking system account after the free trial period. God, an unnecessary expense, right? He chided himself. He was on foot and had to decide where to go. He didn't have a flashlight other than the one on his stupid phone. The thought occurred to him that he'd become too reliant on that single piece of tech. And in any case, that meant following the streetlights until he could find the next turn and get to a bridge. I'm almost home. Just have to make a plan and commit, he thought as enthusiastically as he could manage. It was time to test the classroom theory. He climbed back out of the SUV 
donned his top coat and a scarf that Ashley had knitted for him when they were still dating and started hoofing it down the long parking area that spanned the next few buildings. He stuck close to the fence and the lights, but didn't want to walk any further than necessary. There'd be another exit ahead, or better still, a shortcut toward the river. After a few minutes, the exertion warmed him some. Well, he wished he'd brought his heavy winter coat. The top coat was longer, but not made for a night out in the frozen waste of the urban tundra. As he passed the first building, a plant office, and approached the next, the plant, he glanced over to the space between the buildings, where he'd climbed the stairwell. He saw shady, indistinct figures shift within the deeper shadows. He looked ahead and hoped that they would just keep hiding and stay away from him. <sighs> just figments of my imagination. Uh, maybe stray animals of some kind. Non-rabbit strays, he kept telling himself. Maybe it was homeless people who decided to shelter in the abandoned structures. They'd probably be shy about approaching strangers, unless they in some way felt threatened. If it was people, then his vehicle would likely be toast before he'd get a tow, he thought, forlornly. But oh, better it than him. He had good insurance, after all. He'd already started to forget about the potential threats from the shadows, as he mentally completed the claim form. Justin's hopes of a shortcut were dashed by a long cross fence that blocked his way. He'd passed the second driveway, so he wouldn't have to backtrack very far, but it was getting later, and he was tired and cold and hungry. Oh, he just wanted to go home. It didn't help that the snowfall had increased. It was a nasty mix of tiny flakes and ice pellets, bitterly cold on the gusts of wind, and they stung his forehead where it was exposed to the elements. He wasn't sure he could continue much further. He needed a break from the weather. It was time to find a way indoors, even just for a little bit, to get out of the wind and precipitation. He headed back towards the buildings and the river beyond. He followed the newly discovered fence and found a large gate opening, clearly for vehicle traffic. He passed through and was on the next part of the property, the warehouse portion of this particular complex. Oh, good he thought. No imaginary fiends on this side. He chuffed and slogged until he reached the Warehouse A, Tilancia Enterprises Incorporated. The entrance and front area contained an office section, but there were broken windows on the front. It was definitely abandoned. There would be no heat, but once inside he could make his way to interior rooms that would be out of the wind and wetness. He tried the front door. It was locked and bolted. Seriously, he thought. It was easier just to clear out the glass on one of the front windows and climb through than to try and get through the secured doorway. As he kicked out the remaining pieces of glass, he snagged his lower leg on a jagged protruding piece that was stubbornly placed in the side of the frame. It didn't do too much damage to him, but his trousers were ruined. God, this just keeps getting better, he sighed inwardly as he hiked his damaged leg over the sill and gingerly balanced himself with a hand on the frame. He made it inside without incurring much further damage. This area was definitely abandoned. Not even any junk furniture, just a wet, mouldy floor. The exterior light penetrated into the hallway that led away from the front office. He could see nothing else, and knew that there was no way there was working electricity. He had a tiny light on his key fob, so he stepped into the darkened hallway and used it to look for a more likely room and maybe an old chair or desk where he could sit for a moment. The tiny light wasn't strong, but in the near total darkness, it worked remarkably well when he held it close to placards near each door to read them. The offices on his right had windows, so once he opened the interior doors, he could see at least a little of what was in front of him. The rooms on the other side of the corridor were meeting rooms, or for utility or storage. He was about to enter the largest office he'd found, when he heard a loud noise from deeper inside the large structure. A creaking, moaning sound that startled him and gave his adrenal gland another workout. It was followed by rattling noises. Likely just the wind, but maybe some rats. Nevertheless, he gave a brief shudder. Nothing to fear, Justin. Just fear itself. So stop this paranoia trip, <laughs> he 
chuckled to himself in an attempt to relax his taut nerves. The large office had a chair, but it was broken. However, there was a solid-looking, if ugly, little table in the corner by the window. Oh, perfect! Finally a break, he said to the gloom around him. He had a couple of tissues in his coat pocket at this time of year. Well, one never knew when the old honker would start to leak from changing temperatures. He used the tissues to wipe the worst of the crud from the surface of the table, or at least spread it around some, and then carefully sat on it. The relief was instant. He'd been walking outdoors in snow with shoes that were designed for interior office work. Well, he hadn't gone far, but the dogs were already barking. He attempted to look out the window, but it was covered in grime, and the bottom ledge was filling with snow. There was little light anyway, just the last forlorn beams from the parking lot lights, and they were weak to start. He took stock of his situation. He couldn't be much further to a bridge that would lead back into more heavily travelled parts of the city. It wasn't too late in the evening. Well, he didn't know for sure, since he typically used his phone to keep time, yet the clock in his SUV had read 6.59pm before he'd locked and left it. Well, he estimated it was about 7.30, so people would still be around and somebody would be available to help. He realised he was thirsty. Nothing he could do. His stomach growled. Again, no resources. He was cold and feared that if he sat for too long, the snow would increase and make walking more difficult. He was as rested and warm as he could be under the circumstances. He reached down and tugged his tall pants leg and peered beneath to survey the damage. Ah, just a scratch. Not much blood, he satisfied himself. He'd resolved to get up and get started again, when the already feeble light coming through the window dimmed further. His eyes had adjusted to the gloom, so he could tell that something substantial had occluded the space between the light and the window. He saw a vague silhouette outlined in the window. A hulking figure had appeared to face toward him. It looked somehow fuzzy and indistinct at the edges, but was clearly tall and broad. There was no neck, but it was definitely anthropomorphic and possessed wild-looking hair. It loomed closer, and he saw hot breath fog the window and block even more details. Some part of his mind knew that the lighting and smeared window were lightly just distorting a human figure, but the hindbrain, that little remnant of our early ancestors, screamed at him to run. And he decided to do just that. The figure could be anything from a crazed drug addict to a security guard, but he didn't want to find out while he sat alone in the near dark. As he reached the doorway, another groan and creak emanated from the interior of the building. This one originated from the front entrance and was even louder. It was accompanied by a moaning, hissing, organic sound, like a large animal breathing deeply through some sort of obstruction, or maybe underwater. Well, he had no choice. He turned right and fled further into the interior of the building. He was fortunate that nothing blocked his way as the shadows deepened to full-on darkness. He all but ran full out, his arms stretched out in front of him. And then he hit an obstacle. A wall? No, a door. A large swinging door with a heavy rubber seal. It stuck for a moment, and then gave way when he broke the seal. He couldn't see anything but the hallway seemed to widen into a larger space around him. He reached out to either side, but felt no walls. He drifted right until he touched the wall he'd been following, a solid outer wall of the building. He again started forward this time more cautiously, but still at a good fleeing pace. Perhaps whatever... No, he corrected himself. Whoever it was will give up the chase and decide not to pursue him into this murky den. Then he heard the swinging doors crash open behind him. He again began to run, arms outstretched. He was too frightened to consider the danger of his actions or obstacles that might be in the path of his feet rather than his upper body. He heard the moaning, hissing breathing behind him, accompanied by scraping, shuffling, thumping steps. There was no point in looking over his shoulder in the near total darkness, 
but his fear-addled brain did not make that logical connection. The head turn caused him to lurch left, and he lost touch with the wall on his right. He was now in a wide open space. He could feel the air stir. He couldn't see the threat that was still approaching behind him. And he could run into something at any moment. And then he did. Not a wall or a door this time, but something small and hard, and set just the right height to greet his shin as it rushed forward. His left leg picked up a bad bruise and pressure cut to go with a slice on his right leg from the window glass. Justin sprawled forward and skidded on his hands. His right wrist definitely took some damage. It may have been broken, but definitely sprained. The painful shock of his landing brought some sensibility to his mind. He looked around fruitlessly, then held his harsh, forceful breathing for a moment and just listened. He could hear his heartbeat in his ears. He could hear the weird breathing sounds and freakish footsteps, but they sounded further away from him than they had. There was a coarse, whispering conversation between two or more of whoever had chased him, but the sounds were too low and garbled to make out the words. He had to breathe and try to take an air through his nostrils so as to be as quiet as possible. The result made him gag and he nearly retched. A smell came across the lightly stirring air, the stench of rotting flesh and plant life, of mould, mildew and choking spring pollen with just a hint of fishiness. It smelled like a swamp. No, it smells like the very polluted river, he realised. The entire space was filled with a vomit-inducing stink and it was getting stronger. It was then he registered the shuffling, scuffling steps approaching from the blackness. He felt around himself with his left hand and attempted to find his bearings. His hand came across a hard object, a piece of wood, squared off, about three feet long, with grooves running along the length like something used for packing, his mind registered. He grasped his new weapon and used it like a cane to help him stand. As he put pressure on his left leg, the pain from his severely barked shin shot up his leg to his spine and beyond. Well, he knew he wouldn't be doing any more running tonight. The best he'd be able to manage was a fast limp. He reached out with a stick to try and locate a wall or anything that would give him some security. He hit something semi-solid, and the sound and feel produced was that of wood on wood. He followed his guide stick and felt around for a few moments. Oh, stacked wooden pallets, he reasoned. It was definitely in the warehouse portion of the structure. He felt further and found the wall against which the pallets were stacked. He felt up along the stack and determined that the pallets were stacked to a height just above his head. This was it, as safe a corner as he would find to make a stand. The sounds of large beings with shuffling gates approached, and the moaning, hissing breaths grew louder, and the odour more pungent. At least some of the stench came from these two, three, maybe more, things. His mind gibbered, back on the verge of panic. Then the eyes glinted and flashed. They were large and obviously belonged to nocturnal creatures. There were three sets that he could see. If they were on human figures, then based on the height, he stumbled upon the lair of some kind of pro-basketball player, zombie, vampire, swamp monster people, he thought, as his mind drifted toward a break. Then he thought of his family, and indeed his whole life. Whatever was out there was a threat. He tried to run, tried to hide. Now it was time to fight. Get away, he shouted. Get back and stay back or I will hit you. His voice sounded more high-pitched than he'd always thought it was. He clutched his right hand with the injured wrist to his breast and used his left hand to swing the stick forward and back in front of him to ward off his attackers. I don't want to hurt you, but I will. Oh, I don't sound that committed, he realised. I don't feel it either, but well, no choice. He swung the stick as hard as he could toward the closest set of eyes. Something grabbed the stick, and before his mind could even register that the motion was arrested, the stick was snatched and flung. He could hear it strike something in the distance, and the ensuing clatter as it ricocheted and fell echoed in what was clearly a large, empty space. The moans grew louder, 
and the eyes came closer. The stench became overwhelming and his brain shut down. Well, if there had been light, he would have seen the greyness obscuring his peripheral vision until it tunnelled. As it was, the last sensation he experienced was the train tunnel rush of sound in his ears as he descended into the mine shaft of unconsciousness. His mind registered pain and motion all at once. The pain was in his legs. Something gripped them. They were both pressed together in a large crushing vice of a hand or paw. The motion was from his being dragged behind a large creature. His arms hung limply above his head, and the right wrist registered a sharp pain as it limply struck some small rough object. It was mostly dark around him, but they were once more in a room that allowed some exterior light to penetrate through a large window. When the dragging motion stopped, he was lifted and slung unceremoniously atop a large table. He let his eyes drift slightly open, and immediately wished he hadn't. He squeezed them shut and turned his head away from the intolerable sight. He heard some loud moaning and hissing, some type of slobbery speech. He could almost make out the words. Not food. Look for Cold. Cree. Another coarse speaker urged. Now. Well, the um, discussion went on like that for several minutes as a third, vaguely whiny voice joined in with the others. The argument became louder, and each party grew more insistent and agitated, though less coherent. Eventually the argument, the entire mess of slobbery mush-mouth speech, descended into shoving, grapples and blows. As the sounds of combat resolved, Justin finally had to open his eyes to see if he was in even more danger. No, 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 his mind internally screamed over and over. The three beings before him tussled and slugged at one another in mindless fury. The light was poor, but his eyes had fully adjusted to the darkness. They were all well over six feet tall and disproportionately wide through the shoulders and chests. They were covered in what initially looked like green, slimy fur. Well, he'd seen a movie with a sniper in a ghillie suit. That memory came rushing back to him. They were a mottled mixture of greens and browns and slimy tendrils in place of hair, like a mound of swampy moss had risen and grown arms and legs. Well, the fight had taken the creatures to the far side of the room. It appeared to be primarily between the two larger figures. The third figure just crouched in a corner, and clutched at a wound to its elbow. Justin stared at a moment, mesmerized in horror, and then he saw his opening. The largest monster had shoved the middle-sized one into the corner above the now moaning and screeching smallest one. It held the other by the throat and pummeled at the plant man with an enormous fist. Justin half hobbled, half ran, at the top speed of which he was capable. He fled through the open door and looked around. He was back in the dark, back in the large space. The room had been some sort of break room for the warehouse workers. And then he saw it. To him it was like the proverbial shining city on a hill. A small door with a small window at the end of a long, dark space. It was a cleaner window than he'd previously observed in this warehouse of woes. And he could see tiny, flickering lights on the other side. He made his limping way toward the emergency exit. If this wasn't an emergency, he couldn't imagine one. The sounds of the battle faded behind him as he reached the bar. Even in the dark, without looking, he knew that there would be a sign on the bar that read something like, Alarm will sound if pressed. Oh, if only, he thought, as his mind flooded with temporary relief. Then he heard the moaning and bellowing calls from behind. Apparently the dispute between the monsters had been resolved one way or another, and his fate was once again their concern. He stepped back from the door and into the shadows. He felt a crate of some kind behind him. He hobbled to the other side and crouched. He saw angry, alarmed eyes flash in the dim light from the break room. Then two hulking shapes lumbered out into the darkened spaces of the warehouse. A third limped behind them. It held one arm in the other and slowly made its way directly toward him. This was it. The creature would have him shortly. 
No weapon this time. No big one to jump on it and stop it from devouring him alive. Just death. Slowly dragging its embodiment toward him. When it reached the emergency exit door, it paused. Looked over at him, where his head rose above the crate, and his eyes reflected the modicum of light. It let out a last moaning, hissing breath and pushed through the doorway. Justin crouched in place. He was too afraid to open the door and try to leave with that thing lurking just outside. He was sure it had seen him. He didn't know why it hadn't attacked. Maybe the beatdown from the big one had convinced it to pass on this happy meal. Then he noticed that the sounds from the other two had faded as they moved towards the front of the building. Perhaps it would be safe to follow them. First he took out his little fob light, while the feeble beam reached several feet into the gloom. His eyes had truly adjusted, and the thing was of some use. He took a look at the crate behind which he cowered. The wood framing around it was crushed on his side. There was another crate, possibly metal or plastic, inside the wooden casing. The inner crate had holes in it, but whatever had been inside was gone or dead certainly smelled dead. He made out a label on the wooden frame, some East Asian lettering alongside English letters that read, Handle with care, product of China. Well, thanks, China, he said sotto voce. He used his tiny light to get back to the break room, and then, a little further past the entrance to it, he found a side exit near some lockers and an old employee punch clock. He first cracked open the door and carefully peeked around outside. Nothing. He listened carefully. Nothing. He sniffed the air. A foul odour was trapped in his sinuses, but the air outside was fairly fresh, wonderfully so in comparison to what lay behind him. The snow had stopped. It hadn't been a heavy fall after all. The cold night air awakened his mind, and he finally stepped out with confidence glanced toward the sinister gloom in the direction of the river. He saw a well-lit restaurant district just on the other side, the source of the light through the emergency exit door window. He wondered briefly how people could eat so near the stench of the river. The colours on one of the signs registered somewhere in his subconsciousness and bubbled up into recognition. Oh, Phineas Fubar's Fantastic Fish Tacos. He knew that place. He knew where he was had only to make it a short distance, cross a bridge, and he'd be free and clear and on the way home. He started quickly limping toward the front of the warehouse building. He made it to the front corner, and the welcome light from the parking area greeted him, and the icy breeze slapped into his face, followed by a large hand that slapped him to the ground. He was out before his body struck the pavement, and sprawled supine in the fresh fallen snow. Several years prior. Oh, come on, guys, be careful with that thing. You know the boss wants it put up there for a reason. Big Sam, as the warehouse foreman was known, rumbled at his normally most trusted hands, the inseparable duo of Charlie and Miguelito, little Mike. Charlie, at the controls of a small forklift, glanced at his supervisor. Sorry, Big Sam, you know this lift is about to give out. Should have been replaced a long time ago. Big Sam was a reasonable sort. Yeah, I know, but it's not like business has been great lately. Probably why the boss makes these deals. No idea who the guys are that come to the back door, but I suspect they're government types. Anyways, what they pay is why we still have jobs. Next round of layoffs is coming soon. Places are shutting down all over the River District. You probably best start looking, but hey, keep that under your hats. We don't need to panic. Besides, this means we'll get to start applying for jobs before the rest. Miguelito piped up. Oh, cool, Big Sam. You're always looking out for us. Thanks, man. Charlie nodded in agreement. Definitely. Maybe we can get hired at the same place. Keep the team together. Yeah, well... First, we need to get this monster unloaded and on the floor, Big Sam directed, and flicked his chin toward the crate. Charlie fiddled with the controls and the machine whined, but the lift mechanism did not budge. 
rolled his eyes over to Big Sam. Hey, it ain't budging. It's lifted and lowered its last low. Big Sam cursed in a low voice. Ah, okay, fellas. Guess we can do it the old-fashioned way. Just us to lift, though. Nobody else handles the back door for it. Charlie let out some grumbles as he climbed off the middle machine. Miguelito shrugged and moved to the front of the box. Big Sam and Charlie did the heavy lifting, and Miguelito lifted the front as best he could and guided the load toward its destination. They almost made it, but when the back of the wooden outer crate cleared the forks, the load shifted, and that end of the crate crashed to the floor. The wood splintered, and a few boards sprang. Big Sam stepped back and cursed. He had a gash on his arm and hand. Charlie and Miguelito had open scrapes on theirs. The bleeding trio gamely pushed the crate into place beside the emergency exit door, despite their open wounds. They set aside the shop rules. This job was off the books, and they needed the money. They cleaned up the area themselves and met in the break room. Big Sam had detoured to the front office to meet with a manager and collect their fees. The boss morosely informed him that it would be the last extra income. The owners had decided to shut down the warehouse. Big Sam handed out the bonuses to his friends as they stood around the break room. Uh, enjoy it, fellas. We're all getting the axe next week. Hey, let's get together Monday. Go over to DMT Solutions to apply. Boss said that's where he's going. Yeah, his government friend tipped him off that that's where the backdoor business will be shifting to, too. The others agreed, and they all took a good look around the break room where they'd taken their lunches together and talked about all the things that people think are consequential. Then each man filed out and hit the time clock as they left through the side door. They met again Monday morning, just after the boss came back and made the grim announcement to all the employees about the warehouse closing. The trio was back in the break room, and this time they spoke in whispers. Big Sam held up his arm so the others could see clearly. By the time I got home, I had a fever. Yeah, and I slept all weekend. When I woke up today, this shit had started. He displayed the greenish rash that was lumpy, like spongy moss on his arm around the gash from the crate. The other men had had similar experiences and had similar growths on their hands around their wounds. They all left work to see their doctor. Justin's next day. Justin gripped Ashley's hands as he held little Crystal up for him to kiss goodbye. His son, Caleb, had insisted that he was too big to be held up and had caused his dad to painfully stretch to lean over and hug him. He'd also insisted that he was too big for kisses and would accept only hugs. He got them and Justin was glad for the pain. It reminded him that he was alive and that he had his family around him he would soon return to work, and their lives would get back to normal. He'd even discovered that no one had disturbed his SUV. The tow truck driver had found it, and the insurance company had paid for the tow. The repairs were under warranty. He was covered, and he'd be out of the hospital tomorrow morning, absent only his phone, but that was covered too, and he'd pick up his new model on the way home. Yeah, Ash. Hopefully the fever stays light. I'll get out in the morning as planned. Doc increased the antibiotic dose. Oh, I can't wait to get home to you and the babes. I'm not a baby, Caleb declared. Okay, big boy, but you best my mom and be nice to your sister. Okay, Daddy, the child readily agreed. Justin knew that the agreement was unlikely to last even from this room to the front door of their home. Yet he smiled fondly at his son and winked at his daughter, who was just old enough to catch on to the gesture and giggle as she tucked her head against her mother's neck. Ashley kissed him last, on his forehead. Oh, you are so hot, Big Daddy, she leaned in and whispered. It's not just the fever. She raised a little, met his eyes, and then waggled her eyebrows. Justin let out a little laugh and whispered, Hey, sexy mama, oh, if you hear from that nice lady who found me on the bridge, let's invite her and uh, whoever she might have to dinner when I get out of this place. Ashley agreed and bundled the kids out of the room. It was just as well. Justin was exhausted. He felt incredibly sleepy, and his open wounds itched a little. 
His bed was raised, so he looked down at his legs before he covered them with a scratchy hospital sheet and put the bed in sleep configuration. Hmm. Funny, he thought as he drifted into slumber. Kind of looks like moss growing around the open wounds. <laughs> Probably just the drugs. And I have a big imagination. My friends call me Al, but, well, they are few and far between, the last one passing about twelve years ago. Now there's no one left to call me Al, and so I believe it's the right time to tell my tale to the world. I am a ninety-six-year-old man, born September 4th, 1922, in Berkshire, Massachusetts. Being ninety-six years old, I can tell you that I've seen some wondrous and awe-inspiring things in my lifetime. When I was a young boy, I remember seeing people still riding horses and buggies out in the countryside. I remember listening to the radio at night for entertainment. I remember when DC Comics was first created and started selling their fantastic stories. And then time passed, and soon we were landing on the moon, watching movies on smaller screens in our own homes, talking with people across the country instantly on computers, and building bombs that could vaporize hundreds of thousands instantly, and poison the rest of the world for the remaining survivors. Yes, along with the amazing wonders I've seen in this long lifetime, I've seen the myriad of horrible things that mankind has done to their fellow neighbors. A lot of the younger people in this world claim to be living in the worst of times, yet they have never known the fear that gripped the world during the early 1960s when we all literally expected the entire world to explode. Tensions have died down enough so that people don't have the creeping suspicions that their own neighbours are agents of a foreign power, waiting for the opportunity to steal secrets of their country and use them to enslave the general populace. Yet, even when all these horrible experiences and realities flooded our world with despair, anger and hopelessness, I kept on smiling, content. You see, I experienced something during World War II, when I was serving with the OSS, or Office of Strategic Services, that changed me and my view of the world forever. A lot of men had their minds and souls altered by that tragic period of history, but I wasn't changed by any shell shock from being in the front lines, or from discovery of the massacres committed by the Nazis or the Empire of Japan. I never even went to the European or Pacific theatre, yet I saw something worse than any soldier that was deployed to either one. I mentioned earlier, I worked for the OSS during the war. Now, for those of you who don't know, the OSS was the precursor to the CIA, created by FDR and based on the famous British SIS. Not only were we responsible for espionage action behind enemy lines, but we also were behind propaganda and subversion throughout the world, along with our MI6 allies. Though many people in modern times may not be aware of it, South America was a huge battleground for the various intelligence agencies in the Allies and Axis powers. Mexico and Brazil, though officially neutral, were very cooperative to the Allies, while the nations of Argentina and Chile were sympathetic to the Axis powers and became major points of Operation Bolivar, which involved transporting intelligence via radio and ship to Berlin. It was the fall of 1942, and being a young buck of twenty, and filled with patriotic zealotry, I was ecstatic to be assigned my first field mission, taking place in the jungles of the Misiones province of Argentina. There had been reports that multiple agents of the Sikheidienst des Reichführers SAS, a.k.a. the SD, was seen entering the jungle with many different containers of unknown equipment. The SD was the intelligence service for the SS, so our higher-ups knew that something big could have been underway in the dark canopies where our recon planes were blind. 
preferring to be safe than sorry. They ordered me and six other agents to find these SD agents, capture them, and find out what they were doing. We were all deployed in Paraguay, as that was the safest place for us to be deployed without arising in the prying eyes of the Nazi spy network. Every one of the seven agents sent into the jungle had code names corresponding to our founding fathers. The seven of us were John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, John Hay, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and George Washington. Washington was the one in charge, of course, and I was John Adams within the lot. I don't know why they assigned us these names. Maybe they thought it would boost our morale being named after America's founders. <laughs> I can't say. Whatever the reason, the seven of us were just glad we had each other, no matter what our names were, as we began our expedition into the dense jungles of Missiones. Ahead of us was a hot, humid forest of both beauty and danger that none of us had ever experienced in our lives. To this day, over all the exquisite pieces of art I've seen hanging up in museums across the globe, I place the lush, life-filled, primeval forest of Missiones as the most beautiful thing I've ever seen on this world. On the flip side of that coin, the eldritch monstrosities that awaited myself and my companions within those dense trees has forever instilled in me an instinctual terror of any forest, and I would rather be tortured to death than take another step into that place. We'd been briefed about our mission, but as we began our foray into the overgrown undergrowth, Washington filled the rest of us in on important details that only he'd been privy to. The SD agents, four in total, had been in contact with a local tribe native to the area and seemed to be cooperating with them in some way. One of the containers the SD were bringing into the jungle with them had been broken into and the contents photographed by one of our agents. Our expectations of what had been in the container could not have been more wrong. Instead of weapons, medicine, food or intel, the container had been filled with cultural items. There was golden jewellery, Nazi propaganda, history books, pictures of Adolf Hitler and his inner circle, things that were considered gifts in the civilised world. That was why our orders were to capture and interrogate the Allies wanted to know for whom these gifts were intended. That was also the reason all of us were dressed in Nazi soldier garb and given Nazi weapons. Even though only Washington and Franklin spoke German fluently, the higher-ups hoped our disguises would get us close enough to the four SD agents so we didn't have to shoot them. I can't say I enjoyed wearing the clothing of our enemies, but I was a man who followed orders and swallows his pride for the good of our nation. Washington continued to tell us we had an idea of the general area of where the SD agents could be, but that was about it. The plan was to get as deep into the jungle as possible the first two days, and then split into three groups. Two pairs of two would scout in opposite directions, while the remaining three would set up a base camp. The two groups would report back to later. However, right then and there, Washington told us how stupid that plan was, and that was not going to be how this mission went. We would be sticking together, using seven pairs of eyes to flush out signs of Nazi occupation. If we encountered any resistance, seven guns would be used to wipe it out. When we encountered the SD agents, seven bodies would be there to tackle them to the ground, and seven scary American faces would make them spill their guts. Everyone liked this plan far better than the first, and we continued our march with smiles on our faces. Our enthusiasm about the mission faded with the setting sun. An exhausting day of trekking through unknown territory, combined with seeing things like spiders bigger than our fists catching and eating birds, had drained us physically and mentally. All of us had spent time camping in woodlands, but none of us had ever experienced anything like this. Even when we stopped at night to rest, we didn't really get very much. Though we had a fire, it had to be a small one so as to not attract unwanted attention. Even with a small amount of light produced from the flames, we could see countless glowing eyes watching us from the foliage surrounding us. 
Our ears were bombarded with unfamiliar calls of creatures and the fear of being ambushed by a jungle cat, Nazi-friendly natives, or something still undiscovered by science dwelling in the dark depths of the jungle, let us have fitful sleep at best. Though we always had a man on watch, even the knowledge that one of our companions had our backs didn't really help. When dawn came, we ate lightly and resumed our search. This became our routine for the next five days. Every day we would see at least one beauteous sight the jungle would be inclined to show us, and experience one more horror that awaited within these dense leaves and plants of the shadowy place. I can recall clearest on the third day that we discovered a hidden grotto with an amazing-looking pond. The sunlight gleamed against the water, making it shine brighter than any jewel I'd ever seen before. Yet... When Franklin went to fill his canteen, a snake larger than anything I'd seen sprang forth from the water and wrapped itself around him, both squeezing the life out of him and trying to drag him back into the water to drown him. Luckily for Franklin, the other six of us were upon the monster in an instant, hacking and stabbing the beast with our knives, killing it before it had a chance to kill Franklin or break any of his bones. Five of us, including me, found out later that night that giant snake tastes like chicken. It was in the afternoon on the sixth day that Jefferson discovered a boot print in the muck. We all took a look and collectively agreed that this was a Nazi boot, as we didn't think any of the natives would be wearing boots or shoes at all. Washington ordered us all to fan out, and we all began to slowly and stealthily follow the direction the track seemed to be going. Every once in a while, someone would report to the rest of us that they found another boot mark, and we would adjust our direction accordingly. Every track we discovered seemed more and more recent, and by the time the sun set on the sixth day, we came across the native village the SD agents were staying in. Now, in my old age, I've made it a point to try and expand my mind and rid myself of the many stereotypes of the different people of the world that had been all I knew in my youth. An example of this is my knowledge of Native Americans. Growing up, it was a typical Cowboys and Indians games with the rest of my neighborhood kids, and we portrayed them in a very unfair and very spiteful way. Traveling the Southwest and Northwest and visiting the tribes that lived there when I was in my 60s, I discovered complex cultures and skillful pottery, amazing beadwork and beautiful dances, with proud and kind people behind them all. No one culture is perfect, but I know that almost everything that had been pushed on me about Native Americans in my youth had been cruel misrepresentations. But, well, the tribe we discovered in those dark depths of the Argentinian jungle, they were every bad story of Native cruelty and savagery come to life. The clearing we came across that housed the village was on a downward slope that put us about ten feet higher than the place. We could clearly see, even in the dying light, the village had a crude wall of cut logs surrounding it. From the light of torches that were spanned across the top of the wall, we could identify that, attached to the outside of the wall, were primitive spikes. Every spike was occupied by some part of the human body, arms, legs, or full torso. Some were fresh, blood still slowly seeping out of the wound used to separate it from the body, while others were so old, they were almost completely skeletal. It was nice that all of us were still spread out from one another, so that no one vomited on anyone else but themselves. I think Washington was the only one who didn't wrench, thanks to being a veteran of the First World War. Gathering together, Washington began formulating a plan in whispers, when Hamilton suddenly interjected with, Hey, do you guys hear that? Washington was about to berate him for interrupting, but then the sound reached all of our ears, and he remained silent in order to listen. Through the typical nighttime jungle noises, there was a faint chanting upon the air. From the looks on the other agents' faces, I could tell that none of us were familiar with the language. Though I couldn't understand a single word that was being chanted, 
something in my mind was actively repulsed by the chorus of human voices. Whatever was being spoken just felt wrong, like no human should be speaking that dreaded dialect. It caused myself and Madison to shiver involuntarily. Our position on the high ground enabled us to spot two entrances into the village, on the left and right side of us. After grimacing from the sound of the eerie chanting, slowly growing loudly with every passing second, Washington told us the battle plan. We were to split into two groups, one for each of the entrances to the village. The group of three would see what was going on in the village and determine if the SD agents were there. If they weren't, the three would leave, meet up with the other four, and we would continue our search in the jungle. If they were there, the three would cause panic with gunfire and grenades. We were ordered to do our best to avoid killing the natives, but there would be no repercussions if we did. The SD agents, on the other hand, were only to be killed if absolutely necessary. Hopefully, the agents would attempt to flee out the second opening in the wall, where the group of four would capture them at gunpoint. It was myself, Hamilton and Jay who were chosen to be the three infiltrating agents. Checking our weapons and ammo, we crept down to the wall and made our way slowly to the left entrance of the village, all the while gritting our teeth as the infernal chanting continued to attack our senses and sanity. When we reached the left opening in the wall, we were a bit surprised to find no guards posted there. We were a bit surprised, but chalked it up to good fortune, and doing our best to keep ourselves in the shadows, we sneaked into the village. The huts that served as homes within that unhallowed place were far worse than the war we'd encountered when we first entered the clearing. Clumps of skulls hung from every hut's doorway, some of them still bearing rotting flesh. Skin was stretched into canvases, where scenes of torture, rape and general mayhem were somehow seared in with amazing detail. The smell was horrific, a mixture of rot and decay, fresh blood and fecal matter, burning meat and exotic spices. Hamilton and I had to pause to get our stomachs under control, while Jay wasn't fast enough and vomited as quietly as he could behind a hut. Wiping his mouth, he gave the two of us a determined look, which we shared back with him and we continued our stealthy approach to where we determined was the centre of the community. Hiding in the shadows of a larger hut, we came across a scene of absolute monstrosity within the centre of the village. It looked like all the inhabitants, I think about seventy-five in total, were gathered there, their bodies painted completely black, wearing loose loincloths that seemed to be made of human skin. They all had their backs to us, facing a raised wooden platform around seven feet off the ground. The throng of natives was the source of that horrid warble that had reached a loud crescendo, forcing me to use all my willpower to not place my hands across my ears and scream to try and drown it out. On the raised platform, I could see a shrine and an altar. The shrine was a mixture of primitive art and tools, all looked to be fashioned from bones and leather of men, and of articles that were similar to what Washington had told us was found in the one container of the SD agents. I could make out the glint of weird-looking golden statues, a stack of books, a stormtrooper helmet, and a picture of Hitler mixed in with the horrendous tributaries. The SD agents were on the platform, along with an older native man in an impeccable and abominable headdress, and a young girl. The old native man was clearly a shaman, dressed in ceremonial garb that matched the horribleness of his headdress. The four men in black leather coats each held on to the struggling and screaming girl's limbs upon the altar with one arm, and held aloft a chunk of black stone in the other. Triumphant and nefarious grins were plastered on their lips, and even at our distance I could tell their eyes shone with a destructive light. The shaman with the headdress made of gold, gems and skulls 
was raging a large, malicious-looking stone dagger with two hands above his head. He was shouting something I could not understand, as he brought the weapon over his head, but his intentions were as clear as day. My soul was screaming at me to stop this. Our mission was to capture and interrogate, but some primeval part of my instincts was telling me to kill them before it was too late. Too late for what? I did not know. But I knew something terrible would happen if we let that old man kill that young girl right there and then. I wanted to turn my head to Hamilton, who was beside me. I wanted to try and convince him that we needed to act right now and begin killing these fiends. But something told me the time to act was now, for the sake of the girl, for the sake of me, and for the sake of the world. I raised my Gavir, 43, and fired. I used to be a decent shot, but I hadn't taken the time to aim properly on account of the recoil. Yet something in the universe, whether it be fate, luck, or divine providence, was on my side that night for my bullet missed my target, yet hid its mark. The sacrifice was still made, and I regret to this day that I hadn't decided to shoot earlier to allow my marksmanship to be more accurate. But I got the job done. The native priest, who was my original target, plunged the dagger down into the chest of the young girl uninterrupted, his weapon causing her frightened shrieks to cease and her fear-filled struggles to go limp. Yet, as the dagger was rushing down to meet with flesh, my bullet rocketed into one of the obsidian crystals the SD agents held aloft, shattering it into a million tiny pieces right before the dagger met its victim. A hundred things seemed to happen all at once after that. The crowd immediately stopped chanting and was silent. The shaman screamed in both fury and fear as the body of the girl began to spasm uncontrollably. The four SD agents backed away from the altar, stark terror adorning their faces. The three remaining crystals that had been held aloft were floating in midair, an energy that looked like black lightning arcing between the three of them and culminating in the chest of the child. The shaman was struggling to release the dagger and back away like the agents. But something was keeping his hands rooted to the dagger, and the dagger stuck firmly in the girl's chest. One of the agents, as he backed away, spotted the three of us and shouted something, reaching to his belt for his sidearm. That was when Hamilton and Jay started unloading indiscriminately with their MP40s into the crowd and the figures on the platform. I wish I could describe the ensuing battle that began, but I can't. I wasn't focused on the battle in the slightest. In fact, Jay would tell me later that more than a few billets came inches away from hitting me as I stood there, seemingly in a trance. I told them all only once why I was just standing there, ignoring the chaos of the gunfight around me. And after none of them believed me, I changed my official story to a breakdown of nerves. It was easiest for me just to lie, but now I don't have to spin that facade anymore. I can finally speak the truth after decades of falsehoods. The dark portal was appearing from within the chest of the dead girl, the same hue of black that radiated and crackled between the three stones. It stretched from palm to palm, reached down to her right foot, but could not go any further. The final form of this dark portal was a half-circle, its centre line cutting straight from left palm to right angle, with the shaman and his dagger in the centre. He was trying to break free of the darkness, yelling something and constantly shifting his hate-filled gaze from me back to the inky blackness. And that's when I noticed he was talking to something within that demonic gateway, for indeed, it was a gate. Black tendrils so void of light they stood out against the surrounding twilight, were slithering from the portal, slowly wrapping themselves around the man as he wailed in protest and horror. Ever so slowly, they began to drag him into the abyss, ignoring his thrashing and pleading, 
and I saw his flesh peeling off every inch of him that touched that unnatural darkness. It took only moments, but it felt like years before his head was the only thing left in our world, aside from the piles of skin on the edges of the gateway. He gave me one last look of absolute loathing before his face disappeared into the lightlessness of the void his headdress falling with a clank to the platform. And then, the eye appeared. It was massive, too big for the portal to reveal its true size. Yet I still gazed upon its many pupils, its constant shape and colour changing iris, and the malicious intent it held for the one who had ruined its return to this earth. Its stare forever left a scar upon my soul, for I knew then that I was beheld with animosity by a being that could be considered a god. It had been so close to stepping into our mortal plane, yet this human, this bug, this insignificant assembly of atoms, had stopped it dead in its tracks, earning me its eternal loathing. If it ever had the chance, it would do things to me, torture me with methods beyond the comprehension of what even the most sadistic psychopath could dream. Then it was gone, vanishing within the portal, as the three obsidian stones shattered and fell to the platform. It took a violent shaking from Jay to fully awaken me from my rapture, and I found out I'd missed the whole party. In front of me lay fifteen dead natives from the crowd, on the platform was the body of one of the SD agents, completely shot up, and what remained of the girl. Everything except her head and complete left leg had vanished into thin air. None of the other agents could explain what had happened to her. When Hamilton, Jay and I went to the entrance where the other four awaited, we came across another gruesome scene. Twenty or so natives were dead, Two of the SD agents were also dead, and the last one was dying, talking quietly with Washington as he bled out. I've never seen a man's face so pale with fear as Washington's was. Whatever that Nazi was whispering in his ear, it was nothing pleasant. As we approached, the dying SD agent noticed me, and turned to look at me with a smug expression of defiance. You may have stopped him from entering his kingdom this time, he said in perfect English. It may take a hundred more years, maybe even a thousand, but the world will run red with the blood of men again, and he shall be led through, and on that day the Reich shall welcome him and bask in his glory, and all you fools will beg for mercy and receive none. He will tear your souls apart along with this world, he will rebuild it in his image, and the glorious Reich shall be his angels for eternity. The SD agent hacked up some blood, tried to say more, couldn't, shuddered violently, and then died. The rest of the mission, well, there isn't much to talk about. We gathered what valuables and potential pieces of interest that we could, and made our way out of the jungle. The night I told the rest of the group what I'd seen, and they didn't believe me, I managed to ask Washington, in private, what the SD agent had told him. His face paled at even remembering his words, and all he could say was, Just the ravings of a dying, insane man. Nothing more. I found out a few years later that Washington hanged himself soon after the mission. His suicide note reading only, no proof that he was right, but no proof that he was wrong. I don't want to take that chance. God rest his soul. So, here we are, 2019. I'm the last surviving member of that team, and I have no family left to tell this story to. My wife and son are both long dead, though they're officially still missing. That's the problem with being a spy. The only spies people want to hear about are captured spies and dead spies. I wish they'd had the decency just to go after me and leave my family alone. 
but decency is hard to come by in this world. And mercy and goodwill don't exist in the secret wars waged by the big governments of this planet. But no big public wars have covered the lands with blood again, and I'm always thankful for that. The rise of Nazis across the globe again is a bit disconcerting, but oh, they're nothing compared to the original, so I'm not too worried. The fact that Earth and everything living on it is in our power to create or destroy brings me comfort. I'm not saying that I'd be happy if we ended up blowing up the planet, but well, the idea that our own destruction is in our hands, that we as a species have a choice in our own survival or extinction. That's what helps me sleep at night. I've seen the alternative in my dreams. I see what happens if my bullet misses that black crystal, and the other worldly abomination those SD agents call God gets a full gateway to enter our world. I see that monstrous eye gazing at every living soul across the globe, unleashing torments and sufferings upon the general populace of the planet. I hear the screams and pleads for death as massive, black-clothed beings fly through the sky, their halos a blood-red swastika that drips pestilence and poison onto the people. I smell and taste the acrid air, filled with stench of rotten sickness, the iron of blood so thick you can taste it. But most of all, I feel the hostility towards me like a fire, burning away my skin and charring my muscle and bone. I awake screaming, and though my senses return and ground me in reality, I know that it's still out there somewhere, waiting for its chance to return. I know that it's still watching me with that gargantuan eye. And I know that it is still furious. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.